And we're live. We're back, guys. Uh, Cameron has joined me for this half of the stream. What's up, Cameron? Doing great. Just heard about uh, how Sakaar is getting canceled on Netflix. So I guess Netflix will have a bunch more money to maybe throw David Lynch and Mark Frost away to bring Twin Peaks over to them. That would be... Mm. Dude, would you would you like to see a Twin Peaks on, on Netflix? I'll tell you this. If it goes to Netflix, if it ever did go to Netflix, David Lynch would still have his way and we get one episode a week. Okay. They wouldn't. I don't I think mean, they, they have the drop. technology. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. I mean they drop things every week, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have yeah. to drop an entire season on one day. And then you could watch it fifty times, and that. Uh, yeah, I'd be I'd be down for that. Hopefully they could do it. All right, people are trickling in. Cool. Glad you guys are are up for jumping jumping ship over here. Um, well, they're still on your channel, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, jumping to the, to the other, ch the parallel ship. <laughs> um, so I don't, I know you have more details about the final dossier than I do. Uh, yeah, but do we really want to talk about them? Um, no, <laughs> I mean, well, I, this on this, the eve of, I, I will say this. I know, I know a few things that would be considered spoilers. I'm not going to say them, but I may give like little hints to say that, um, I don't think you're going to have to worry about this book. Like if you were on the fence about the secret history okay. and you were like, where's the twin peak stuff, you're going to get it with this. Um, but that's not to say that this is just a nostalgia trip and you know, we're just here to please the fans mm -hmm. uh, from taking a look at what I've seen in the book. It seems very likely that this book was part of that book, the original book. And it was just excised out. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Which I don't have a problem with. I mean, I do have a problem with when I bought this book, hoping to get some of the stuff that we get mm -hmm. in this new one. But now that I would have both, well, then I don't have a problem now because now I have the whole book. It Yeah, I guess, I guess it makes I wonder if he went back and revised it. He did. Okay. I can I can tell because obviously they, they mentioned the, the secret history and Oh, you know, I already went through that, so now I'm. I'm. This is me finishing mm -hmm. up my notes. So he kind of tweaked a little bit, but a lot of that is just the uh, the introductory chapter. Uh, so uh -huh. I mean, that would take you what all of a, you know a day or so <laughs> to tweak it. You know what I mean? Yeah, just fill in fill in whatever blanks or yeah, whatever. because every chapter is just a uh, uh, a character. So mm -hmm. you get a chapter on Shelley, a chapter on uh, Audrey, a chapter on. Uh, you know, the uh, Annie and, and Wyndham Earl and, and even Ray Monroe. Oh, yeah, and, that, that, was, that was a surprise to see. They would have a chapter on him, but I guess yeah. he was deep in it. Well, remember, he, he was an FBI informant. Mm -hmm. So they're probably going to get a little bit of his backstory and how he hooked up with Mr. C. That's pretty cool. I like yeah, that. No, I like that. I was surprised. Honestly, I was. You know, There's a whole that. chapter on Judy. That's, That's shocking. <laughs> There's a whole chapter on Philip Jeffries, which I'm really intrigued by, considering that Philip Jeffries is a David Lynch, Bob Engels character. So I'm mm -hmm. curious to see how Mark Frost treats it on his own in a chapter of a book, as opposed to, um, you know, what season three took him to. Yeah, that's I, I, I I'm such a Philip Jeffries buff. I just want all Philip Jeffries. I don't, I don't think that the. the the not a teapot was enough for me, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, listen, we're 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 uh, Twin Peaks may be the season may be over, but we're we're still in the middle of it. I mean, there's there it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime. I mean, I there's know. the obviously the book, the pop up shops, the uh, the festivals, the uh, the Blu-ray set, all the extras on the Blu-ray set. Uh, the fact that David Lynch is apparently working now on a director's cut of Fire Walk with me be because the fan edit is going everywhere and he wants to put his stamp on the fan edit. Do you do you remember when that fan edit came out? It was a couple years ago, right? It was right. It, honestly, in pieces era. Uh, it was it was like, oh, like three or four days after the missing pieces hit. <laughs> OK, but but the one that's going around now mm -hmm. is like the final like re-edit like if you had seen it like that first week it wasn't mm -hmm. as good as it is now okay. uh, that being said because i work a lot in video and editing uh sound editing 
there's like three or four little mistakes that I see or hear when I watch it. And I mm-hmm. wish I could figure out who this Q2 guy is so I could let him know what they were. Cause if he fixes those, then like, uh, I, you know, don't, don't anyone repeat this, but uh, I, I'd probably pay some good money to get that on Blu-ray. The- <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure a lot of people would. Uh, yeah. I, would. I mean, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I just, I would like, but I just, I can't do it until those corrections are there and they're small. I mean, cause I'm a oh. nitpicker. Yeah, I mean, right. we're talking, we're talking like a, a second of, uh, you know, if you coughed, you wouldn't even hear it. But uh, to me, I go, ah, oh, such a bummer. But anyway, but it's really good. Have you seen it? No, yeah, I, I, I saw it probably, I didn't see it right away when it came out. I think I saw it sometime in 2015, I think. Mm-hmm. But so I don't know which edit it's, I've seen. It's really well done. And I honestly was kind of poo pooing the whole thing about it for a long time because I'm like, well, you know, I'm not. I like the movie the way it is, but I also think that some of those missing pieces need to be in the film. Mm-hmm, but this, but this guy seemed to just kind of throw everything in the kitchen sink in there uh, <laughs> without like thinking about like what should go in the movie and what should be held back from the film. But after seeing it, I can still make the, the case that, yeah, some of those scenes should not be included in the movie per se, yeah. but it didn't bother me when I watched it. Can you give an example? I'm curious what you think of what shouldn't be. Well, he yeah, did make the listen. He made the smartest decision of all of them by not including that Cooper Diane scene. This is the <laughs> worst scene ever. I remember reading that in the script and it was awful in the script. It's awful in the film. It's so amateurish. It's awful. And Kyle's acting is, 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 is <laughs> so horrifically bad. It me up every time. And I'm just like, what Dale Cooper is this? Are you trying to sink the ship, Kyle? I don't understand here. Um, what shouldn't have been in the movie? Um, I mean, yeah, I agree with that one. <laughs> well, I mean, little things like them all leaving Hap's diner at the end and then, you know, at the end of the night and saying goodbye to Irene when they're all getting in the car. I mean, those are just those are just tail <laughs> shots you shoot just in case you need something at the end. I mean, I don't think Lynch had any intention of ever <laughs> incorporating those into the movie. I don't you think know. so either. So, uh, so including those, I was like, well, you could leave that out, but he put them in and whatever, you know, so, (laughs) but overall, I got to say, I mean, I, I kind of ate my words a little bit because I was kind of saying, I I don't like this idea of fan cuts and, and that type of thing. But then when I saw it and I saw the care that the Mm -hmm. guy put into it, I, I was impressed. The one I was really impressed with the most is, uh, when Laura runs down the stairs and she's going to, you know, then it dissolves and it shows her driving to Harold's and then she arrives at Harold's. But in the script and in the, uh, uh, the way it was supposed to be, she ran, runs down the stairs and bumps into her mom. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, she's coming in with the groceries. And I remember thinking, okay, how the heck is he going to do this? Because that there is such a huge sound design going on with her opening the door and running down the stairs and then it dissolving to the car, you know, mm-hmm. that's a very hard thing to, I mean, you can tweak it in terms of uh, 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 photography or like the visuals, but the sound design, right? I mean, the sound design was done for the theatrical cut because it's made that way. It's not done for the long version, mm-hmm. but he did it. She I runs down the stairs. Actually. She runs down the stairs and bumps into her mom exactly the way it needed to be. The sound design was c- perfectly... Uh, worked with so that it didn't call attention to itself that it there was like a jarring cut in there it was perfect and from that moment on i was like this guy knows what he's doing and i'm very happy to be watching this right now i honestly don't remember that i have to i have to watch it with headphones on next time yeah and uh so uh and uh the vlog lady just made a video the other day talking about firewalk with me and she's just seen the fan edit too so um you know (laughs) so it's funny how the fan edit was being seen by all these people in the community but not by the people who had all the youtube channels and now we're we've all seen it now pretty much and so we're Mm -hmm. like all right now now we're championing it uh after the fact but i will i will say this about firewalk with me Uh, i know people really 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 love that movie um I really like the movie and I love, I, I mean, I do love it, but the, I always can see what's not in the movie versus what's in the movie. Like I'm very happy what's, what's in the movie, mm-hmm. 
but I'm always haunted by what was left out of the movie or what could have been in the movie as well, right? I mean, there's all this... I mean, remember, I mean, when they first sat down to write the screenplay, the opening scene was going to be the atom bomb sequence that we got oh, right, in, yes. part, in part eight. Can you imagine what that would have been like in the movie theater? I, you know, and then going from the whole thing of, uh, you know, <laughs> Bob Bourne and Laura in the orb and all that, and then all of a sudden... Boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, Laura's now walking down the street. And mm -hmm. that would just, you know what I mean? That would just would have been crazy. I mean, I think you just gave him another edit to make. <laughs> well, that might be where he, where he goes with this. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I remember I remember when uh, the summer of 92, when that movie came out, and reading, getting a magazine, opening it up, because I had heard that everyone came back. I remember, you know, it's... <laughs> And everyone had shot stuff that I was super excited about. And then I opened up this magazine. I don't know what it was, People Magazine or something like that. And it said, the two-hour and 14-minute movie uh, is just Laura, Bobby, Donna, James, and her parents. Everybody else has unfortunately hit the cutting room floor. <laughs> and it said that. It said that. Everybody wow. else has unfortunately hit the cutting room floor. And I remember just like screaming, like what happened, right? Oh, and, man. And, and then when the movie came out and it was getting all these one star reviews everywhere. And I remember getting this one newspaper. I was visiting some friends and as fire walk with me one star. And I'm like, oh crap. Um, and again, you know, people had it out for Lynch after Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart because of the whole, like, you know, misogynistic kind of angle. And I thought, well, here's a story about Laura Palmer. Mm -hmm. And it's it's all about that. So people are going to probably target him and that. But I remember reading this one review and I just gave it one star. Actually, two different reviews. Uh, and one said, this is David Lynch's Friday the 13th. And I got really excited by that. I was like, yeah, that sounds actually kind of cool. Um, it's not that. Uh, no. when you say it, but my favorite review came from my local hometown newspaper where it said the movie begins with a TV screen being, being, uh, 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 you know, smashed. And that's Lynch's, um, you know, statement to the medium of where this TV, this TV show thing originated, but it ends with Laura Palmer laughing in our faces. And that's Lynch's statement that he took his, <laughs> took our money and ran. <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh and i was God. like you know what <laughs> that makes sense because i remember like a lot of my friends and my family we saw fire walk with me and we all had the same reaction at the end which mm -hmm. was and i saw it twice in the theater was i really liked it i thought it was really good um but that's it because now, in retrospect, when you look at, it, there's a lot of things in there, right? Where there's the owl cave ring and and the and, mm -hmm. and 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 Nanny showing up and all that stuff. But for the most part, it's just kind of Laura's thing. And at the time, you have to understand, a lot of people just looked at it and said, "We know all this. Oh, okay. There's nothing that's, new here. That's fair. Where is everything else?" And how come Laura isn't as interesting in the movie as she was in the series? She's dead in the series, but you hear so much about her and oh, yeah. there's none of that in the movie, right? It's almost like, uh, there's too much, there's too much good Friday and not enough Easter Sunday. Right. I mean, right. I mean, it's okay. like, no, I mean, it's like no, 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 no. I got, Laura I Palmer. We get dark, 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 dark stuff. Leland dark dark if you go by fire walk with me right and again i'm only throwing this out there because it's it's just fun to discuss this oh yeah but if you go by fire walk with me leland palmer's the prime suspect day one of her murder well yeah. nobody suspected him at the, in the series why because leland was able to mask that right there's no masking at all in fire walk with me now i understand the stuff at home that's a different story but mm -hmm. with him screaming at the people at the the motors place don't you think they would have been like well you know there was this weird moment like two days ago Where he's like when <laughs> screaming at us you know that never came up right uh, so it just kind of cracks me up but anyway but laura palmer you know there's too much just dark 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 uh 
and not enough like where's her you know tutoring Josie in English where's this kind of stuff I love the scene of her on the phone with Dr. Jacoby mm -hmm. right um those th those scenes need to be in the film because they help balance it out a little bit I, that's no, all I, I'd agree that's with all. that and, and and that's the thing like with Blue Velvet I think is like a perfect film I think Wild at Heart is is pretty much as perfect as you can get it if you, especially if you see those deleted scenes you see that they 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 managed to get everything in there, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at Fire Walk With Me, they had 11 months to write, shoot, edit it before the Cannes Film Festival. Look how much hit the cutting room floor. Look how much quality hit the cutting room floor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that they were in such a rush that they weren't able to get the, the tone and the balance right. Now, that's not to say that what's not in the movie isn't good. I think it is good. But I do think it's strange when I hear so many people saying Fire Walk With Me is Lynch's complete masterpiece. When a masterpiece to me means I wouldn't change a thing. And Fire Walk With Me, as good as it is, and I, would, I, I, would, I would love to move in some of those missing pieces scenes in there because uh, I think they would balance the film a little bit more. And by doing that, then you're acknowledging the fact that it's not quite a masterpiece because if you would change anything, it can't, it, can't, it, can't, it can't be. But that doesn't mean that I don't love it. And I, I, and I think that's what's... And I think if anything can be taken away from Fire Walk With Me now is that season three really makes Fire Walk With Me look good now. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Lynch, Lynch ultimately wins because I really do think that the ultimate goal of season three or the limited series as it's now... The limited series run, yeah. Right? I, I really do think that at this point, the whole point of that series now was to redeem Firewalk with me because he was so ticked that so many people didn't like it because listen, it, okay. season three may not answer a lot of stuff that a lot of people want to know about. Although I think Mark Frost's book will help a little bit with that, but the stuff it does answer about Firewalk with me about Philip Jeffries, about how, there was a whole bunch of confusion as to um, when Kyle, when Kyle in the movies, like, don't take the ring, Laura, don't take the ring. And then you're, like, you're confused. Like, should she take the ring? Should she not take the ring? I don't understand this. This seems like a lot of logic because this ring thing is all new to the movie itself because it wasn't in the series, but season three puts the ring into perspective. And so now, you know, that when Kyle's saying, don't take the ring. It's because if Laura takes the ring, she's going to end up in the lodge. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and like the whole thing of like, you know, feeding, feeding the blood of Leland to the floor. Right. And then the floor, the blood on the floor becomes the Garmin Bosia. And, you know, it's just little things like that, little touches like that, that just, I think the new series just really, you know, and I think that's a lot of Mark Frost putting ideas into it and trying to tie it together. Because Lynch is a – listen, I love Lynch to pieces, but he's he's not one to tie things together. He's one to just say, say things and move on. Yeah, I, yeah. I've been, I've been talking to people about Lynch, and I'm getting – I think I think I find myself getting a little more agitated, but, like, I, I know it's misguided agitation, especially with that. Or maybe I'm just messing around with the, the idea of how Lynch works more. I don't know. Why are you I agitated? Guess. I don't know, it, because – like, I expect them to be – I don't know. Let, I expect them to follow like modern rules a lot more. And there's that part of me that wants him to follow those rules. But then there's the part of me that loves Lynch and it's like, just let him do his thing and let him let the cards, you know, fall. I don't mind him doing his thing. All, all I ask is that stay within the continuity you've set up. Yeah. I, you know, but see that, I think that's where my frustration comes in, but he didn't, he didn't. He never really had that issue until he, he until Fire Walk with me. Be, before that, he, he. I mean, he didn't. Honestly, he didn't have an ongoing thing except for Twin Peaks. But in the series, he didn't just start throwing stuff left, right, and center. I mean, when he would come back to do an episode, it was still the same continuity as to what was happening. Um, you know, Fire Walk with me completely flipped everything. Um, even though, I mean, it does kind of more or less follow the story. Everything is purposely flipped in that movie. Everything from, you know, you have uh, uh, Dale Cooper, which is DC, and then it flips to Chester Desmond, which is CD. Mm -hmm. When Bobby comes into the school, 
Laura's homecoming picture is the one that she had at home. And the one at home is the one she had at school. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. And at first I was thinking, I remember in the theater thinking, who the hell did the continuity in this movie? Because this thing's <laughs> completely crazy. But there's so there's so much of that. There's so many issues with that that it had to have been done on purpose. Lynch cannot go oh. that wrong the entire time. I was going to ask, do you think it was a complete like disregard? Like he did. If it was once, if, there? if it was one time, I would be like, yeah, but you know, it's through the whole movie. Okay, that's fair. And the idea that Deer Meadow is the flipped opposite of Twin Peaks, you know, it just, <laughs> you know, it just goes from there. No, I I see that. I didn't, I didn't even think about that until you just mentioned it. But do you think? Do you think of Twin? Let's just say, you know, in a weird world where Fire Walk with Me comes out now, and then we we haven't ha- we don't have season three at all. Like it comes out now. Do you think it would? How do you think it would do now? Wait, you're talking about the Laura Palmer movie coming out now? Yeah. 25 years later? Let, but, I mean, with like today's temperament, like today's culture of, you know, the way people watch movies now, do you, how do you think it would, it would do? Because I think it's changed. What do you mean? Just the way people approach movies and what their, ex- their expectations. Oh, it still would have bombed. You think so? Oh, yeah. Okay. If a new Twin Peaks movie came out today, it would bomb. Well, yeah, I guess box office. Yeah, I guess. Compl- there will. I, I, I know you're never supposed to say never. There will never in our lifetime be another Twin Peaks movie <laughs> that comes to the movie theater in our lifetime ever. It, Not, will, come, it, it will. It will go to Showtime. It will go to Netflix. It will go streaming. It will go somewhere else. It will. Ne- they will never open a wide film. On twenty five hundred yeah, Street, not, yeah, not like Twin that. Peaks Fire Walk with me. I could see, I, mean, I could see it playing at like these like indie theaters, these small theaters, like a small release, but nothing. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, Lynch spent the uh, the least amount of money he's ever spent on a movie on Inland Empire, and 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 still <laughs> and still did not break even. I I get yeah. I mean, what was the most? What was the biggest movie he's done? Box office. box box office wise, yeah, probably the Elephant Man. Okay, I can see that. I mean, because that's like, you know, that's an Oscar nominated movie. I mean, so was Mulholland Drive, but you know that uh, it it was it wasn't made to be an Oscar film. I mean, <laughs> I could yeah, I could see when did Mulholland Drive come out? Two thousand one. Yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, officially 2001. I mean, it was made in 99. Oh, right. Okay. Because of the show and whatnot. Well, <sighs> trying, to, trying to think. Do you, do you think there's going to be any sort of... Do you think the final dossier is going to show any finality? Or do you think it's going to be open-ended? Well, I mean, the, one of the last chapters is called Today. Hmm. So I like that. <laughs> and, and, and and I mean, that's got to be, you know, the the new world that Cooper and Laura I, slash I Carrie Page are in. I don't think it's going to be a long chapter. No, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the uh, I mean, you read the Shelley chapter, right? Yeah, I read it. OK. Based off that, don't you have a good sense about this book? Because it's like it's really interesting I mean, I mean, who would ever think that Shelley Johnson? I like the character, but I mean, reading a whole chapter about her is another thing. But it, it, it's short enough where it doesn't overstay its welcome. And it tells you some new twists and turns mm-hmm. in her past that is interesting and kind of makes you think about things in a different way. And I like that a lot. And uh, yes, it doesn't get into whole all the red stuff, but it does, you know, kind of s- set its way towards, uh, you know, where we're going. You know, I think I made my peace with that red stuff. I want to say it's just sort of like a fling, almost like a rebound kind of thing. I don't know how, like, I don't know what her and Bobby's deal is, how long it's been off, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. They don't really, well, well, yeah, they, don't really well, they don't really get into that even in the in the book, so... But I, I mean, I like it. I like what I'm seeing, you know. And I've read, I've read, I, I, I've read a little bit about, um, um, you know, Audrey and mm-hmm. Annie and things like that. And 
it's cool. You know, I like, I like, I like it. It's a, you know what though? It's kind of a shame that all of this is coming out in a book. <laughs> well, yeah. Now that doesn't mean that I needed to see this all dramatized, but it would have been cool to maybe mention some of this final dossier of the movie. No, I mean, no, I mean like, you know, when you have Bobby and Shelly sitting at the diner or something, I mean, you know, you know, Shelly, I'm sorry. You know, this, this isn't the, the way I, I wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. I understand Bobby. You know what I mean? Like just, how about just throw us like a line or two <laughs> that makes a reference. Some, I think, I think it was you that were saying uh, one of your shows the other day, how like cold everything was, especially for our main, you know, our main group. We were just sort of, sort of like omniscient and watching and unlike the original series where we were in it with them. Right. I think you were the one that said that. Yeah, I was probably, I don't think anybody else is saying that kind of stuff, but at least on, on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, listen, it's, it's Lynch gets me all tongue tied sometimes because while I really enjoy it, mm-hmm. you also have to stand back and look at it and say, okay, I, I enjoyed this as sort of like a huge continuation of the series, the mythology, you know, and, but compared to the original series, it is more or less like looking at characters through a microscope rather than being fully engaged with their characters. We're completely kept at a distance. Half the time, we don't even know what the hell they're talking about, you know, because because even the actors didn't know what they were talking about because they were only given the scenes that they yeah, were in lines, right? their lines or the scenes they were in. So there was no coming into the scene and no going out of the scene. They were just given the middle of a scene. And you think about like the whole, like, um, like something that people really like is the whole Ed Norma stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The Ed Norma stuff is what? Four scenes. So they're at the diner. Ed's sitting, then he's sitting in by himself then Nadine talks to Ed. Then Ed comes in and and proposes to Norma. That there's their arc, four scenes, and that and it all happens within, I think, two episodes. I'm not knowing how that ends and sort of the ideas that have been going. Do you think it was sort of, you know, almost like it's? I mean, I I guess it could be almost shot like if it is actually a dream or it's so fragmented. And you're like just watching scenes play out rather than participating. Yeah, it almost feels like a Terrence Malick movie or something. Just like we just kind of come in and out, and yeah. you know, we just don't have nar- narration. And and you know, the whole thing about like I understand like the whole Ed Norma thing is like this happy ending, and I, I I agree. I like to think of it that way as well. Same. Here. How, however, it doesn't help that those scenes take place after David Lynch makes it very clear when he says the dreamer dreams, the dream and then lives within the inside the dream. That doesn't help me Lynch because you gave me this long scene of Ed sitting at the bar with his eyes closed and the camera pushing in. And then the hands come up behind him as if he's, he's got a sad manifested it. Yeah. He, he, he's just thinking that Norma's coming to him and he's just choosing to live in that dream world of being with Norma. And because we never see him again. <laughs> see, the, the the way I perceive that scene, and especially after reading, um, I think I saw that scene after I finished uh, Catching the Big Fish, was that, I mean, he, he was sort of wishing for it. And it was kind of that thing where if you, like, if you, like, go into yourself and you wish for it, you could sort of make things happen. So he could be just, you know, dreaming it, or he could have just sort of, in a weird way, Okay, well, that you know what I, I and, and if that's true, then that's awesome, and that's the way I would love to look at it too. Mm-hmm. My issue is not with that scene because that scene is brilliantly acted, filmed, mm-hmm. the music by Otis Redding from the Monterey Pop, mm-hmm. which was done right down the street from my house. Actually, oh, um, sweet. <laughs> uh, it's it's amazing. It's an amazing scene. This is my issue with that scene. Hit me. It's it's. It's different, but it's very similar to the scene that happened What uh, in the seventh episode to the ending of the second season where Ed just walks into the diner, grabs Norma, and says, will you marry me? That's right. <laughs> right? It's just like, I've been here before. Why are we repeating this? Why are we at the diner? Why don't we see Norma at home? You know, I mean, because because I mean, I thought they were referencing Annie when she said that, oh, you know, I, I need to spend more time with my family. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I was like, well, maybe we'll have Ed show up at Norma's house and then we'll see Annie or something. I don't know. Like that would have been great, but no, everything's at, it's like, it's like Ben Horn never leaves his office. He's either sitting at his desk or just standing up with Beverly. That was, right. that pained me. So I wanted to see more Ben. There's ben well, yeah, Cause he's great in it. Norma's always sitting in that booth doing that damn paperwork. Right. <laughs> um, Drinking her protein yeah. powder. It looked like. Frank Truman during the entire fight with the Bob ball at the end, never leaves his desk. He's sitting through the whole thing from the woodsman <laughs> to Hawk running into the it's room, like practically this. pulling up his pants going, what I miss everybody. Um, he never leaves the chair. He's just sitting oh, at his desk. And I'm like, Frank Truman. And I, it made me think to myself, maybe this was supposed to be Harry, you know, and Michael Onkin looked at this role and said, I'm not coming out from Hawaii to do this crap. And I just, could see that. And just said, no, no, I want Harry to be more, you know, with Cooper. Mm-hmm. So I fine. They, so that fine. They changed it to Frank. It doesn't hurt anything. I think Robert Forster, listen, I was a Robert Forster fan through this whole series. I think he's excellent. And I think he is excellent through this whole oh, no, series. I agree. Yeah. He, he didn't do anything wrong. But I think it is kind of strange to completely mute <laughs> your, your sheriff right and just have him sitting at the desk the entire time like that's and then having cooper who's your hero of the series go are you freddy all right freddy you're you're in charge now you know that uh, honestly out of the whole the whole return that whole scene is probably my least favorite but you know what though i i I honestly i could care less i mean i i i was fine with it i could care i'm just saying i'm getting to the i'm looking at it i'm they want me to look at this through a microscope so that's what Mm -hmm. i'm doing Right. Okay, that's fair. So I mean, I mean we, I was talking about lynching Avengers, like going all the way up to that finale, and I, and I kind of got it, and I don't know, <laughs> not what I expected, but no, I mean, I mean, the, the, this is what I expected. This how this shows you how wrong I was. I thought that something was going to happen with uh, Mister C, mm-hmm. and I thought the woodsmen were going to come because that's what Sarah's vision was—that men were coming. Men were coming. I thought that, okay, I, I, I honestly thought they were going to kill Dr. Jacoby and take over his podcast because, like, they did the radio station. I thought that was going to happen because that seemed to match thematically. Mm-hmm. Then I, th- I also thought during the scene when, 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 when the woodsman showed up in the sheriff's station, I thought, oh, my God, this is brilliant because what's going to happen is they're going to turn, the woodsmen are going to turn and see not just Ray Monroe, like out there out in the dirt, they're going to see all these people seeing them do what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And they're going to turn and start attacking all of them and killing them because that's what they did back in the forties or the fifties, whatever. And then that's where Freddie is going to come in. He's going to like the woodsman. So yeah. He's going to start crushing heads like the woodsmen were with his fist, with his, with his hand. And that will leave Cooper to fight Bob. I wonder how much time was in between when they wrote at part 17 and wrote part eight, because you, I don't know from the way Mark Frost talks, especially at that talk he gave, it seems like that they're kind of aloof. I don't well, know. Well, they said, he said he spent, they spent one year talking about the series, one year writing the first two hours and then another year writing the additional 16 hours. Ah, uh, Okay. And maybe that's why the first two hours really click with a lot of people because mm-hmm. it was the thing they spent the most time on. Maybe that's why they showed that at the Cannes Film Festival and it got a staying <laughs> ovation. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I get everyone, it. And maybe everyone was there going, I can't wait to see what happens with Sam and Tracy's character as the series continues. <laughs> oh, they're not in anymore? Oh, okay. You know. Oh, they get... <laughs> oh, the glass now, But, but, but I'm seen. curious though. Let's, okay, listen. Um, I mean, I, I thought it totally, I, I really liked the series overall. I thought it was really just an amazing summer, but we had that week and then we had, uh, you know, you, you know, you see an episode and then you wait a week and you think about it and we do podcasts about it. And, and then we talk to have guests on and we talk about it and then we analyze it. And then we were always wrong most of the time, most of the time, <laughs> but I wonder what would have, what would it have been like? Okay. I'm not talking about Netflix. I'm not talking about any of this, right? Let's say Lynch and Frost. Uh, saw your, your your videos prior and they're like Joey or they contact me and Cameron and whoever else um, you know Emma the vlog lady we're gonna fly you out 
all of you to LA. We're going to put you in a theater. Okay. And you guys are not going to be able to sit together. You're going to be just scattered throughout. There's going to be 10 of you here. And we're going to show you the entire thing as one movie. No, no end credits, nothing. We're just going to play it all 18 hours. I'm curious what our reaction would have been at the end. Because if you, I mean, I'm not talking about the Netflix thing. I'm talking about just you sit in the theater and watch it all. Would we have been bothered by some of the stuff? Probably not because it's just flowing continuously as opposed to us stopping, Stop it, yeah. thinking about it, analyzing it, and then realizing that nothing, you know what I mean? It's just like watching it two or three times before the next episode airs. Right, right. So I, 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 I'm pretty sure that would have changed a lot of stuff. I believe it. By yeah. the time we got to the end, which would have been almost a day later, <laughs> and, and Freddy's fighting the Bob Ball, I guarantee you a lot of us would be thinking we were hallucinating at that moment. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Be like, I'd be like, damn, what they put in this popcorn? <laughs> oh my god! I like, I keep, I, I want to tell myself that I'm going to be able to do a viewing of that at some point, just straight through. But I think that's exactly what would happen. Oh man! I mean, it would have been cool to get flown out. <laughs> Reggie says no one could sit through an 18-hour movie with, with no breaks. That's a whole day sitting still. You know what's funny? I remember being in high school. And watching the entire series with somebody mm-hmm. with one six hour break. And and we and we did it right after episode 14. Uh or no, not 14, uh, 16. So the re- resolution of Laura's story. We watched the whole thing in one day. Laura's story ends. We went to sleep, got up six hours later. Star the next episode, which was three days later, and we watched to the end. So yeah, it wasn't continuously, but come on, that's pretty close. No, yeah, that's how how long? Well, how the late? other episodes are about fifty minutes long, so you know, give or take, you're, you're looking at about uh, probably about fourteen hours. Okay, but still, I mean, that's pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is close. Jesus, <laughs> I've I only mean, done that. I've only done that like. Uh, how many times? I've only done that really once, I think. But I have watched the series when I was when when, I, when the series was on. It would played uh, a lot of times Saturday nights at ten o'clock at night. That's when it had switched over, especially during season two. So I, what I would do is I would literally watch the last three or four episodes prior to the new episode. So I'd rewind my tape and I'd watch them all. And then in time for me to you know hit record for the new episode. But that way I was, I always felt like I was up to speed. You know, you have to understand back in 1990, we didn't have DVR and Netflix. I, I mean, you, you had to like remember everything. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember taping stuff. I, but I was taping cartoons. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean those those are those those, those, those those amazing times, you know. They always talked about like, oh, Twin Peaks—the worst thing that ever happened to it was the uh, Saturday night ten o'clock, sh- you know, uh, you know slot. Mm-hmm. And I I kept thinking, no, this is great because you know I was, I was a kid, so I didn't I know where to be. <laughs> but Twin Peaks <laughs> people are party people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because it originally, okay, it was on Thursday nights against Cheers, and it did actually really well. And then it moved to Saturday nights at ten o'clock. It did it, the the uh, season two premiere was a Sunday night movie, so that was kind of fun. Um, and I actually fell asleep the first time I watched it because the second season premiere, it's kind of dull. I mean, yeah. I, I I've learned to really like it, but it's quiet. Yeah. Well, and all that hospital stuff is just like, okay, mm-hmm. is this Halloween too? All of a sudden, come on, Lynch. Uh, but it, it, you know, eventually it picks up. But I remember falling asleep and waking up, and it was still on. And then in my half sleep, like this, there was the first time I saw at age fourteen the the Laura death in the train car, and that woke me up. And then it was over, and I was like, I guess they solved the murder because they show Bob, <laughs> and you know. And I'm like, well, I guess that's the killer. I guess Lynch and Frost decided, you know what? We're just going to answer this in the first. We're just going to answer the first episode. Little did I know that, you know, Bob was an inhabiting spirit. 
They don't. Yeah, that's right. They don't reveal that till season two. Yeah, no, but that was the start of season two, though mm-hmm. the the death in the train car. But uh, no, but then it went to uh, uh, Saturday nights at ten, and then they thought it would pick back up, so they moved it back to Thursdays at nine. And I remember Lynch in the TV guide is just saying, in quotes, "Have a party," and I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, I'm in parties." I don't know. It was kind of funny, party? I guess. But I mean, like, I mean, I was all about Twin Peaks, but. I was kind of mad. I was going to have to miss cheers because <laughs> I liked cheers back then too. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, no, those are, those are good times. I really, really, really miss, miss that time. I, and I almost got a replay of it uh, this summer. I mean, I, what happened this summer was that year, year and a half on a, um, on a wider scale because it wasn't just my friends and I on the phone talking about it. Mm-hmm. It was literally Everyone. worldwide. Yeah. You know, I mean, we had people from all over the world and we, we, you have people on your podcast. I have people on my video podcast. I've never even met these people in real life, but most there's some, of them, of, but there's some of my best friends. I know. I've been talking to all, most of them throughout the summer, probably more than I talk to people. I actually know. I don't know if that's sad or not. <laughs> I think it's just the nature of the beast now, which is fine with me. No, I, I, I love it. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing. Cause I actually, um, a lot of people that I grew up with, I just, for whatever reason, I, I don't talk to them as often as, or ever, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's really sad. And and so it's it's just kind of fun to reminisce and talk about things that, uh, you know, I love and, and, and care about and, and, and then find other like-minded people like that. I mean, I mean, the only, the only way I met you is because you were watching one of my podcasts and someone said, Hey, Joey, you should be on one of his podcasts. And you oh, said, right, yeah. said, and you said, Oh, I'd love to. And I was like, well, who is this guy, Joey? And then I looked you up and I was like, Oh, this guy. Yeah. Come on. on. <laughs> That's what happened. I had only done like a handful of twin peaks videos before I started covering like the whole, this whole season leading up to the season. I had only like when I found out that they were making a new season, that was like probably my first twin peaks video. And then I just started doing, you know, Fire Walk with me, watch alongs and stuff like that. Uh, not watch alongs, but like theory videos and stuff. And yeah. those kind of took off a little bit, and I was shocked, honestly, because I didn't, I didn't like, I, I wasn't in the Twin Peaks community yet. I didn't know what the like the temperament was. I didn't know if people were still like cared. <laughs> uh, and then I found out. Uh, oh, believe me, a lot of me. people care. <laughs> no, well, believe me, when I started these videos, that nobody cared. I used to get like fifty views on these on these videos. I mean, nobody cared. Uh, but then, but, but then, you know, once the Blu-ray set hit, once it hit Netflix, that's when people started caring because people started able to watch it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just, you know, the complete doofuses like me that have the original broadcast on VHS and I break it out every once in a while, you know, um, I I need to see if I could find like one of those VHS copies. Well, if I, if I still had my DVD burner, I'd burn them. But I, I don't. I don't have any more broke. Um, but I mean, the the original. I mean, it, it's amazing because the DVDs and the Blu-rays. You know, they changed some stuff. You know, I mean, if you mm-hmm. get the, if you have that gold box DVD, the uh, the scene right before Leland kills Madeline is completely added, like two shots that aren't in the broadcast, oh, yeah, and, right. and, 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 really and it's not even like good. I'm trying to, you know, you know, like if I ever had Lynch on an interview. I'm not going to ask him, hey, what that glass box mean? I would be like, okay, who was in charge of the gold box? And how did they manage to add two extra shots into an episode <laughs> you directed? Can you explain that to me? I feel like that's something he'd probably answer if he remembered. Right, because I'm not asking him about the mean of anything. I want to know specifics. Behind the scenes, yeah. Who, who, who messed with your episode? What do you uh, feel about this like gigantic behind the scenes thing we're getting in the Blu-ray? Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Did you see that clip? Yeah, I saw the, the, the clip. Yeah, make it hot or something like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. But, but you know, it, I mean, it really goes to show that, um, you know, it was it was all about just getting Kyle and Laura back together again so that, you know. I mean, we all called it. We're like, yeah, Blue Velvet. And he literally says Blue Velvet 25 years later. Well, he's also lying out of his ass because when he shot that, it was Blue Velvet 30 years ago, not 25. Oh, right, yeah. So he doesn't want to feel that old. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah i was like wait 25 it's only been 25 since twin peaks what are you exactly talking about? exactly um you know if you know 
If, if if I was an ass and been on that set, I would have been like, it's like it's like Dune all over again, huh, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The sleeper has awakened. <laughs> I love that he's, he has the coffee in his hand, always with a coffee. I, I'm really excited just for that. I'll probably alone. Like, sure, we get the blue return in, on Blu ray. No deleted scenes, though. I know. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. We'll, maybe we'll get something later on. But the behind the scenes, to see the behind the scenes of that is going to be phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, don't expect to, you know, have anything answered. Oh, no, no, no. But, I'm just I'm like interested in just like the production. Yeah, I'm interested to in seeing them uh, running over a, a kid doll. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Scene. They're, they're gonna. They're probably gonna show that. It was a heavy set, heavy day on set that 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 evening. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see Lynch directing those extras from that car accident scene. All right, have a worse look on your face. All right, <laughs> overact. You underact. Okay. We're right in the middle. You got it. You got Aces. It. Super. Aces. <laughs> I also want to see the him directing the um the swaying people <laughs> in the Audrey scene. Oh my god! But they nailed it. They yeah. like I like that a lot. I, I th- like that's it. gonna be really cool to see. Hopefully they put it in. You heard about the Audrey stuff, right? But the well, you in, read, in, in the final dossier. N- well, you read about um. Well, a little bit, but the uh, you read Mark Frost's comment on on yes, Audrey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. for those of you who don't know, we could share. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, you you could go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. it, that the original intent was that she owned a uh, hairdressing salon, and that um, and that she Richard was her was her son, and that uh, Lynch decided to you know change it up, and so he did, um. And so we got what we got and Frost had nothing to do with that. That was all Lynch written, which shows. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have to say it really does show. Um, but, uh, and that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying you can tell who it's wrote just, what. Yeah. Everything Lynch writes is kind of short. Like uh, the com- the, the sentences are, I don't mean that like, it's look, like look, concise. Look, I mean, it like you see Charlie and Audrey, where they're speaking indirectly about a lot of stuff, that's Lynch. When you see Dr. Amp, that's okay. Frost. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Right? When you see Wally Brando, that's Frost. Right? That's not... Road, rise up. Well, because it's just so, like, jokey in terms of the writing. The writing is crisp. Yeah. Right? Yeah. right? I love Lynch. It feels like writing. It's, it's writing, right? Yeah. Um, Anyway, and that's could be good or bad depending on how you want to look at it. But um um Oh yeah, but but the thing I find so interesting is that at the end of of the um the scene of Audrey, you know, she wakes up wherever she is, the mirror she's looking in is a hairdressing salon mirror. Now that he says it, it makes complete sense. Now, I don't think she's waking up in her hair salon. All right, but I do love the idea that they took an element from that story mm-hmm. and still incorporated it, even though it has nothing to do with it. I just love the fact that they threw in that mirror. I'm sure, uh, and now knowing that, I'm sure they don't even know where she is. Mark, uh, well, you, you... no, but, but but Frost book does get into her story. Okay, and man, I gotta tell you. Uh, he he worked it in as to why that her mind is wandering to her and Charlie. And see, this this is this is the thing. You already this, read that part, right? Yeah. Okay. And I I think it's great, and I can see why Lynch was like Frost. We are not publishing this until after. Okay. Because if you read it you understand exactly why she's thinking what she's thinking when huh. she, wh- wh- wherever she is. Okay. Let's say the doppelganger took her and stashed her someplace. And this is her mind, you know, running through a bunch of stuff. You can see like why her mind would be dreaming of this stuff based on the story that Frost came up with. Okay. It explains why Ben Horn's family and, and, and nobody talks about her. 
it gets it it, it, re- it really answers that stuff. It, and it, it answers why they don't speak talk about her. Yes, that's interesting. And you know what? It's plausible. Oh, I'm intrigued now. <laughs> right? It's not like uh, like well, they just came out with a bunch of crap, and we're not we're they're just not going to talk about Audrey and and all that kind of. I mean, it's like okay, this makes complete sense. Oh. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that now now to some people that's blasphemy because they love the lynchian where you kind of think your own thing and, and that's great too i love that too but i love the fact that the co-creator is like in my mind this is what leads us up to why audrey is thinking the way she's thinking wherever she is okay? see i love i love mark frost i don't <laughs> i know and, people aren't and that is it to me it's really cool because but you can see if if they had published this before it would take away from it well no, maybe but it actually it wouldn't have confused people oh well okay that's probably right. the better way to put it right and so in a way it's like yeah it would have taken away a lot of the mystery of those scenes people wouldn't have been talking about the audrey charlie scenes for three weeks going what's going on here would have know, we would have known what was going on okay Right. And um, so in a way, I understand why they didn't publish it early. But now that we're getting it, let me tell you, it's going to make those scenes, even though, you know, the scenes are <laughs> very interesting in terms of the way they're written and, and performed. Um, I, I, I think uh, they, um, they, they're more coherent now. I'm, I'm very... and, I, and I really like the way they, they, they talked about Audrey and her parents and um remember um audrey did tell agent cooper that emotional problems do run in her family <laughs> okay <laughs> okay i'll i'll uh <laughs> i'll sit on that oh man so i'm i'm, I'm definitely excited and I can, if if they're if they're talking about that, I can only imagine what they talk about with Annie and <laughs> Wyndham. Well, I'll I'll get to that in a second. I don't know about Wyndham though. Uh, Four hundred two in the chat says Mark Frost doesn't get enough credit. Lynch is at the Cannes Film Festival accepting all the accolades, and Mark Frost is sweeping the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> I I love Mark Frost. I know she, people, like I know we both agree on whether like if Mark Frost were to take it over, we'd be okay with that. But I know I get, I get a lot of hate for that for saying that. <laughs> well, you know, let's be honest here. Lynch took it away from Mark Frost and made Fire Walk with me. That's true. So I maybe guess this is the retaliation a little bit, not a retaliation. But, but you know what, though, as much as I love Mark Frost, I really did not like that book. You didn't. Li- you didn't like this one. No. Now that doesn't mean that I might not go back and look at it and go, okay, well, now given the context of season three. I like this aspect, this aspect, this aspect. I do think that that book is extremely too long, and 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 Maybe. it's and it reads like a college textbook, which is brilliant in one way, but not entertaining as as a reader. I think with with this book, there's a lot of cool stuff in here, but a lot of the context, there's no real payoff in the series. No, except 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 for the 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 sex ritual. Yeah, I was going to say the Alistair Crowley stuff, but that's pretty much like... But even that is not like... You don't have Cooper and Diane saying, okay, this is what we're doing and mm-hmm. why. You know what I mean? It's just like... Um, I would now, you do, now you do know you do know that they do answer who the little girl is in part eight, in the book. The final in, dossier. In the final dossier? Yes, the final dossier, you will get the answer to who that little girl was in part eight that ate the bug. Huh. I'm surprised they're giving that away. Well, there's only, a, well, you know, as Lynch says, that's Mark Frost's uh, story. Oh, Jesus. Uh, but there's only, two, there's only two possible people it could be. So you're probably 50-50 right no matter what you choose. Who do you think it is? I mean, it's for me, it's either Sarah Palmer or Diane. Well, you're right on one of those. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't say Diane. I wouldn't say Diane. I would say Linda. 
Oh, Linda, right. Okay. Because Richard and Linda, um, obviously, were, you know, when they have their little scene in the motel, it's to the same music that was playing when they were kids when the radio station got mm-hmm. attacked. Platters. Yeah. So, but yeah, you are, uh, you are, you are 50 uh, 50, but you are, uh, you're on the right track. And, same person, uh, wrong name. And I will say this I will, I will give another hint. Um, the middle name of this girl is Judy. Is it Judy or Judith? It's Judith, but it's Judy. Okay. Come on. It's the same damn name. <laughs> I mean, can't, isn't Sarah Palmer's middle name isn't Judith, is it? No. <laughs> uh, is, it, is this another trivia question that I'm, that I'm, that I'm uh, bombing out of? I mean, I don't think we know Diane's middle name, so... Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Some people, some people in the chat might be mad if I start talking about some stuff. Uh, me personally, that that nothing like this would ruin it for me. But maybe for some people, it would. So I don't want to bother people. Reggie said, Mark Frost said in an interview that he surprised people still don't know who the little girl is, and that's what people got ticked off about too because they're just like, wait a minute here, um, you gave us no clues as to who this girl was. Now. Who did everybody say it was at the at the at part eight? We all said Sarah Palmer. Sarah Palmer, yeah. And we got shouted down by so many people in the community saying Sarah Palmer is not Ecuadorian. <laughs> I didn't get that at all. And I my like, argument I... to that is Lynch doesn't give a crap. He's going to cast whoever he thinks is best for the thing. Now, wh- what I thought, honestly, I didn't think the girl was Sarah Palmer at first when I when I first was watching the scene. Mm-hmm. I thought we were because we saw the birth of Bob. I thought we were going to see Bob overtake Leland and the little boy was going to be Leland. I was thinking I, that too. I thought we were going to get that story, which we didn't. Um, but yeah, uh, but the girl is somebody that uh, we meet in the series. And uh, but that that opens up a you know a bunch of other questions like. All right, so the bug was always incubating inside that person. You know, um, I don't know. It's interesting. We'll have to well, talk. Yeah, about we'll, it. we'll we'll talk about it later on once everybody's. We'll give it a week or something. <laughs> this 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 book will. Um, uh, once you get it, if you're a diehard Twin Peaks fan, which most people are going to bu- that buy this book, you are going to devour this book and be done with it in four hours. I believe it. It's only 160 pages. Yeah, I'm probably going to finish it tomorrow night. <laughs> You already got it. No, no, no. I it's coming tomorrow. Oh. I got I got the shipping notification. Oh my god, mine doesn't ship until I don't get it till November tenth. What? Why? I don't know. <laughs> when did you pre-order it? A long time ago. Oh. It says it says uh, it will get there between the sixth and the tenth. Jesus. So, yeah. So <laughs> I am going to be making one of the last videos about. <laughs> And by that time, everybody will have said what they wanted to say. And good, then I can steal all your brilliant ideas and say them on my podcast. No, I'm kidding. It's all right. It's it's a stream. It's a it's a it's a stream. It's a it's a it's a um yeah. I, I, consciousness. It's a high listen, mind. Listen, I uh, um I agree with Reggie here. It says I will just finish the book in the bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say I, I I I will I will say this. Um. Buy okay. Listen, if you're a massive collector, buy the Secret History of Twin Peaks because I did. I you know I got it again, mm-hmm. but I would say if you had to pick one, right? I, I mean, or or what version? I would get the audio of Secret History, but I would get the book of Final Dossier. I'd agree with that because the Final Dossier will be a book you will read a few times. Secret History, you may go back and look at certain stuff, but I don't think you're going to read it cover to cover. No. multiple times i haven't done that I, I i've definitely gone back and like looked at certain sections but i haven't reread sure. the whole thing but i think the final dossier you will read it cover to cover a few times okay from what i've seen now the annie stuff um from what i've seen uh i like it it's a little it's a little too easy and there becomes like a a, a theme going on 
Uh, you know how like in the series, right? So many people were living in mobile homes mm -hmm. and, and there was this whole like thing of, uh, you know, people living in poverty or abandoned neighborhoods and things like that. Um, there is another parallel theme, not of that, but of, of there is a theme in this book of the, these characters kind of all start ending up in similar situations. And that's interesting. It is interesting. Um, but it's a little bit too, you know, what's the word, Pat? Or you just kind of, it's a little too, it's a little too easy sometimes. Okay. Uh, but that's okay. I'm not against it. I'm just saying by the time you get to the fifth character ending up where they are, you're like, this again? Is this like a choose your own adventure where I I, I keep ending up on page 67? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but no, it's... Uh, and they end up poor and sad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Annie Blackburn became Roller Girl in Boogie Nights, and uh, that was it. Um, no, oh, so, uh, but no. You know what though? I was the most most nervous about the Annie Blackburn chapter. I figured. <laughs> you want to tell the people why? <laughs> well, no, because I've been flirting with this idea. I've been wanting to do this idea for, since 1992, actually, mm -hmm. of doing this like little fan film that I've been wanting to make forever. And you know, life goes on. You know, it's just kind of a fun little thing. Like, oh, wouldn't it be great to do it? And you go about your way and you, you never make it. And then I thought, um, oh, wouldn't it be great to do this? This is years ago, uh, like 2013 or so. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great to do it now? Um, and then they announced the new series was coming out. So I was like, you know what? I can't do it now because who knows what they're going to be doing. And I don't want to listen. I understand it's a f fan film, but me having respect for these people as artists, uh, I don't want to do anything that, that negates their work. Mm -hmm. So series ends. Great. So I'm like, okay, now maybe I can do the fan film now. Well, now the final dossier comes out and then they're going to talk about Annie, which is partly what the film's about a little bit. And I'm like, oh crap. Now Mark Frost is going to do something <laughs> that where I'm going to be unable to do what I want to do because this is following the, what happened afterwards and my story kind of touches base on what happens afterwards. And I don't, I don't want it to crisscross and, you know, negate yeah, what yeah, he yeah. wants to do. So I was so apprehensive to look at it because I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to just not ever be able to get, make this because <laughs> it's just, anyway, the point is what I'm trying to get to is that um, while he does continue the story in a certain direction, that is a little bit different than where I was going to go there from what I've seen, there's still enough gaps in it where I can still kind of put in my stuff and, and not negate what he was doing. Okay. Now I'll, I'll have to touch base with what he is doing because he's now set up events. You know what I mean? But that doesn't, but that, but that just, but that's, that's fine. That's part of the challenge. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, but I'll, the good news is that like eighty percent of what I wanted to do, I can still probably fit it in. Good. So that I'm, makes me I'm happy. Super excited to. <laughs> no, this is gonna be. To be. Uh, oh, it's it's gonna be crazy if I end up doing it. Let me tell you, <laughs> it's gonna uh, be crazy. If you ever need help, I don't know right. what I could do, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll, when we get yeah. to that point, we'll get to it. But anyway, I'm, I'm super excited, and people have been actually very supportive. And, I think and, they trust you with the material. Yeah, but I'm kind of shocked too because of all the people online that just like only Lynch can make Twin Peaks. Oh, Mark, Fro Mark Frost, stay away. Only Lynch can do it. Only, and then I'm like, well, I'm thinking about doing this fan film, and I get like hundreds of messages. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. And I'm like, well, I thought only Lynch could do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Those voices aren't loud enough, apparently. I guess you know what though. Maybe, maybe as a fan film, people are like, go for it. Yeah, but, it won't but, be. But if Showtime hired me to make something, they'd be like, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Get on a like, only Lynch. <laughs> Menting Coma says only Lynch and Cameron can do it. <laughs> well, he, well, here's the thing. Um, what about I, Frost? I do. Yeah, I do. I, but, but, but listen, I do think, I do think by the time Thanksgiving rolls around, I, I think we're going to get our announcement. And. We're, we may not get an announcement that something is happening, but we will get an announcement whether something is happening or not happening. That gum you like, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> no, but and again, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is what I'm predicting. I'm predicting two standalone Twin Peaks movies, not a series, but a movie. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'm predicting one original film by David Lynch that Showtime is going to make. And those three things will keep people happy until whether season four gets made or not. And I can see, and, and this is the two films I see. I see Mark Frost writing and directing one. Okay. And I see Mark Frost and David Lynch writing one with Leslie Linka Gladder directing it, who of course is Showtime's Darling Showtime, from yeah. Homeland, who she also directed several episodes of Twin Peaks. So I see Mark Frost writing directing one, Lynch and Frost writing one with Leslie Linka Gladder directing, and an original film by David Lynch. You do that, Showtime. I will. I will. I will uh, get your your uh, streaming service yet again. I, I mean, I'm I'm totally. I'm, I really. I I mean, I really want to see somebody else direct it. I love Lynch, but I, I'm just so curious. Like my curiosity is just like burning a hole inside me. Now, now listen, let's listen, listen. Mark Frost. He he did not get. I mean, he 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 wrote a lot of the original series, but there's one episode that he wrote and directed solely with nobody's help. And that was the season one finale of Twin Peaks. And that is brilliant. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, oh, lit, written by Mark Frost, David Lynch. It's written and directed by Mark Frost. And boy, oh boy, is that an amazing episode. One of my favorites, for sure. I mean, just the whole thing of Cooper talking to Jacques Renault. Jacques, I'm curious about the chip. What happened? You know what I mean? It was all oh, that damn bird. Bird? <laughs> You know what I mean? And it's just like those close-ups on, on Jacques. Bite the bullet, baby. <laughs> you know? And then Cooper goes, we got a trout in the line, Hawk. This one's a keeper. It's like, yes. It's yeah, it's, it's so like, perfect. And Jacques getting shot, and then it cut that cut to Andy, Andy sitting, yeah. standing there with the gun. Andy. <laughs> and it builds and builds and builds. Climax, climax, climax. And then all of a sudden, Cooper shot. <sighs> end of end of uh, episode uh, season one it's brilliant if 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 they made one mistake or, i mean i know there's a lot of people make uh say that season two made a lot of mistakes if they had made one mistake in my opinion i still maintain that it should have been winham earl who shot cooper at the door and not josie because that would have bridged it would have yeah. it would have bridged the story tighter because when cooper says to josie why did you shoot me, Josie? And she goes, because you came here. I'm like, well, that's a really easy excuse <laughs> to get her off the show. I know she's trying to do Heaven and Earth with Oliver Stone, but uh, oh my God, that is like the worst excuse. Because ever. you came here. Yeah. <laughs> now, don't get, now, don't get me wrong. They did make it work where we understand why Josie would, would have done it. Well, yeah. I, I'm just saying, take that element out. Um, yes, I know Earl liked to play the mind games, but I also think that he wouldn't be above just showing up and just plugging Cooper right from the start. I agree. I know. Yeah, I agree. Like, like to me, I felt it's like, like this, yeah. Well I, well, I felt like he would plug Cooper, and then since Cooper lived, he would fuck with his head. He uh, like he would he would shoot him, so he knew he would live. Because I feel like he would. He's just capable of doing like shooting somewhere in a very specific area. Uh, but yeah, I feel like that's totally up his something he'd do. <laughs> Um, yeah, people in the chat are, are wondering if I have a log that is giving me these predictions. Uh, no, I just, you know, I, I know people, I know the, the, <laughs> the, I know just kind of the vibe of what is happening and what people are flirting with the ideas of, I'm not saying this is happening. This could break down at any second, but I'm just saying that Showtime does not want this to go away. It wasn't a huge hit for them. But it got them a lot of press and a lot of acclaim from the critics, and they like that feeling. So that, that's all. And like I said, Lynch and Lynch may not want to uh, do a you know another full season, and if that's never going to happen, we're never going to get eighteen episodes again. But smaller little things, yes. And I'm not saying like oh in the next year we're going to get these two films and Lynch's film. I'm saying over the course of four years, five years. This is what we're going to get. And then may maybe a season four. I think it's a really nice niche to have just to have. I, yeah. I see it as that. I know it's not a, a huge investment, but it's a nice niche to, you know, have a, a hand in. Cause it's, it's like big without being, you know, super massive. 
I feel like I feel like it just it it works. And it and it might be one Twin Peaks film, okay? That maybe Mark Frost writes and Leslie Lincoln Gladder directs it. I don't know, um, but I can see Mark Frost using this to kind of get a directing gig out of this because he hasn't had one in a while, mm-hmm. and he's good at it. So why not? And I know Lynch would. Hey, you've been writing your books. Go ahead, you know, do a standalone thing. Remember? I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but about ten years ago, fifteen years ago, Mark Frost was like talking with abc about doing standalone agent cooper mysteries on abc you told me this yeah and obviously that never came to fruition and i was kind of actually against it because i'm like come on you ha- you cannot just do it like colombo where agent cooper is on a mystery for two hours because maybe now you could but then no because we had to deal with the doppelganger and all this stuff you couldn't just you know just begin it where we had no answer to that story that would be <laughs> like everything up to Laura Palmer case, maybe before Caroline even have a young Linda Merle. <laughs> but see, no one wants to see that. Oh, no, I would. I don't at, want to see at, that at, at, at the time, but um, no, I, I've always maintained that's a fascinating story to yet to be told. Um, but uh, I mean, I mean, the, the the great thing about where they ended it now is, and a lot of people would say, like, well, I don't even know where they would take it from here. But the cool thing about it is if Agent Cooper did indeed change history and, and Laura's alive, which is what it looks like, mm-hmm. then that probably means not everybody died that that was uh, that died in the original series. So they could bring back Josie Packard. They could bring back. I mean, what I find interesting is, you know, how the Black Lodge uh defies time and space right kind of like Mm -hmm. where the giant is so if it defies time and space and um agent cooper did you know flip flip it where uh you know laura palmer is indeed alive right now again this is revisionist history here right Oh no, I, but, I love but, this but, kind of stuff. But, so, but, but <laughs> this is completely revisionism because they certainly did not think about this at the time. Yeah. I'm just saying, looking back, if Agent Cooper saved Laura Palmer from dying and she didn't die, then you know what's really cool about that? Then that explains why Leland Palmer in the season two finale says to Cooper, I did not kill anybody. Uh huh. He's sort of like time displaced. I think everybody he's is. He's in the lodge. He doesn't know why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the hell? He's like, what? What the hell? I got these these screwed up eyes. Um, you know, uh, somebody's chastising but me, see, but me see, I killed but, my daughter, but, and I didn't but kill see, anybody. But see, I, I I think no matter what, if Laura even wasn't there, I think he still kills Ron at Pulaski, and I think that oh, yeah. I, I think he destroys Ron at Pulaski sort of like what Jack the Ripper did with Mary Kelly to the point where they, they uh, uh, can't identify her. So she's known as Jane Doe or otherwise American girl. Yeah. That's how I, that's how I explain it to myself. I mean, you know, we, we could, we're, we're wrong and we're right. A lot of the time it's like, just like these little nuggets. Listen, I think if you can make it make sense to you, then you're right. Mm Hmm. Doesn't mean you're right for everybody, but I'm just saying this is how I'm able to, you know, sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, I guess you. I totally get. It. I totally get it. I've been sleeping better. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had a but, stream in a couple of weeks. I, I did. I did cancel Showtime though. Oh, you did. Mm-hmm. The moment they announced the date for the Blu-ray, I was like, I'm out. <sighs> now, I'm now, sure. now, if they come back with this thing and they say, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do this extra stuff, I'm back. But easy as that. There's no listen. Listen, it, it, uh, how many times in a week did we watch these episodes? Probably three or four times yeah. a week, right? Three Each easily. three or four for me. Um, I'm done with it until the Blu-ray. I can wait a month. Same. I mean, I had, I, I, I had Showtime for like three weeks after it was over. Four weeks after it was over, I easily could have watched watch some of it again or all of it again. Mm-hmm. I went back and watched a few scenes, but for the most part, I didn't even bother. Right. So I'm like, you know what? Cancel it. And the Blu-ray is going to come out. It's going to look so much better than what Showtime showed us anyway. Yeah. You know, uh, I love you the idea. Been... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I love the idea that the Blu-ray has more extras than the DVD version. I'm surprised there's even a DVD version being released. That's 
Yeah. I mean, I'm who sure. doesn't have a Blu-ray player by now? It's I mean, they didn't. <laughs> Look, the, the reason why I say that is because they never released the, uh, as far as I'm aware, they never released the entire mystery mm-hmm. on DVD with the missing pieces. So, you know, I think people have to wait for the Criterion Disc DVD to be able to get that. Um, so, you know, uh, they weren't making concessions for people who didn't have Blu-ray then. Yeah, it's it's weird. I, I guess maybe that's a Showtime decision. I don't know. That of a CB, CBS released the missing pieces, right? Well, CBS, well, CBS and Showtime are the same company. Okay. But uh, they, I mean, they, I mean, they put the whole thing out. In the, listen, no matter what, we, even with this new season, uh, maybe a year, year and a half from now, there's going to be another box set that has the entire thing. <laughs> and, and with with even more stuff in it, so don't 4K get used to it. upscale of everything. But right now, though, I do have to say the Blu-ray right now on Amazon is clocking in at about fifty-five dollars, which is exactly where I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. On uh, it started at sixty-five, it dropped to fifty-five, but I thought fifty-five is a pretty good price for what is it eight discs on, on a Showtime show and, and a behind-the-scenes movie, pretty much. Because usually Showtime goes. Um, Forty-five dollars opening opening day for uh, Homeland, and mm-hmm. that's like ten, maybe twelve episodes. I'm not sure. So, but this is like at least six more than that, plus all those extras. Expect to pay fifty-five. I will be thrilled if it hits forty-five before. I could see it dropping in the next month. I'm hoping now six Push months. From, six months from now, you're going to be able to pick this thing up for about thirty-four dollars. It's going to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. But who the hell is going to wait six months? Um, to I'm probably going to pre-order it within the next month. <laughs> now, here's my question to you, because this is this has caused some controversy over on my channel. If there were no extras on this thing, okay, and it was just the episodes, right? Mm-hmm. Would you buy it first day, or would you wait for a sale? I mean, I'd probably... Without extras, I mean, I'm not in a rush to see it again on Blu-ray, so I'd probably wait. But the the whole behind the scenes mo- like thing is well, that's that's no, that that seals the deal. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just saying, if it was a bare bones, nothing else on it but the episodes. Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you exactly what I would have done because people are like saying, "Oh, come on, Cameron, look at look around you. You have all these DVDs. You would uh you would have bought this thing first day. I wouldn't have. What I would have done." was I would have bought a streaming version of it, like on Vudu or something like mm-hmm. that, and then waited for... So I would have... Because I would have had it anyway. And then waited for the Blu-ray set to come down in price. But they've packed this thing with a lot of great extras. At least... It could be six. It could be seven and a half hours, depending on mm-hmm. whether that 80 minutes factors into that initial six or whatever. I'm hoping it's seven and a half. But anyway, um, those extras alone, that's a day one purchase. I agree. So, I mean, that's what sold me. It sold, when I saw that, I was Jesus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And even I though I don't know. mind the the cover for the for the for the the oh, blue, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not crazy about it, but I don't hate it. I mean, I understand it. it it's to complement the Laura cover that they did. I'm curious though, is this going to be a, a a you know a pull out box or is this going to be a lift box like it was? You know, I could others? I could see I could see the cover being you know Cooper, Mister C, and the pull out when you pull it out, it's the atomic bomb. Like on the inside. Well, yeah. of course, considering that the original series on the, the bottom had a blue rose. And I remember thinking, why the hell is there a blue rose in this entire mystery box set? Considering <sighs> that the blue rose is in this series about 10 seconds of the entire thing, including the movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, that blue rose is in the movie for 10 seconds. Oh, I know. And the and blue rose. Been... <laughs> yes. I know what you're going after, Chet Desmond. The blue rose. I'm like, it's like okay. the blue. You know, I, I remember in '92 thinking to myself, "Listen, Lynch, I love you to pieces," but I felt like he wanted to tell Laura's story, but Laura's story had no mystery to it because we knew everything. So I felt like he was throwing in like Philip Jeffries and blue roses in there just to kind of give them something to play with because otherwise he'd just be making a, uh, uh, you know, a afternoon school special of a, about a girl who, you know, was suicidal. I mean, the most mysterious thing about the Laura story is I, I would say the painting, the whole thing with the painting. No. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the thing is, though, is that painting in the movie 
it's just a painting in the movie and well, she yeah. has this dream where she's in it. Yeah. But like in season three, oh my God, no, no, they, no. They, well, they expand upon it. And so therefore it makes it interesting. But see, I, 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 I'll honestly, I was interested in it before the context of season three. I but was, you didn't really know like the context of it though. It was just yeah. like a, a painting. Now it's massive. Now it went from like, oh, what is this thing? to like this huge scale, like well, what yeah. actually happened there. Well, obviously, you know, um, yeah, I, I've had people, you know, say like to me also about like, well, okay, that's an entrance to the above the convenience store, and the the uh, the bottom of the Great Northern is an entrance to the above the convenience store, and I don't really know that to be a fact. Uh, you know, it's kind of like um, you know when the when when the doppelganger sitting there, you know, holding his mouth, and the red drapes appear, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, it almost seems like well, the red drapes can appear anywhere. Yeah. Right. So I almost felt like agent Cooper had this key that could open this like boiler room door. And it really didn't. That's not really a gateway to the above the convenience store. That was just an opening for him there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like if someone else had walked in that room, they wouldn't have ended up at the it's above because the he's store. Cooper that he, yeah, he could. Go right. To, right. It's like time that. bandits or something like that. The door is open for him only. Mm -hmm. He is you know? the magician, I guess. So, well, you never know when you walk and doing this and fluttering the, which is weird. It's, only, <laughs> it's like it's like one second of film, pretty much, and yet we all remember this, and it makes I you was like, Who, uh, what? Right, because he showed he showed none of that in like episodes one and two. And then all of a sudden, he's just like a Jedi. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, it reminded me of you know the ending of uh, towards the ending of the second season when everybody's hands doing this, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, it looked like he had like total mastery of the Black Lodge. You know, it would have been awesome if he had just burned down the evolution of the of the arm, just been like, "Fuck you, little not Mike." Existent, you you not existent. You know, it's like, okay, let me ask you, why the hell was that little evolution of the arm thing popping out of the sidewalk, telling him to squeeze his hand off? Like, what what is the evolution of the arm's game plan for wanting to help Dougie in that moment, just to? Be, do you know what I mean? I, I understand like they want to live, but that's that's Mike. That's you know, or as he's known in the series, Philip Gerard, which was right. which is surprising because he's supposed to be Mike in the Black Lodge and Philip Gerard selling shoes. Uh huh. Right. Anyway, I didn't, um, I didn't get that either. But <laughs> anyway, it's bizarre. But anyway, but but why is the evolution of the arm popping out of the sidewalk, wanting to protect him? You know. See, I haven't really thought about that that much, but again, that's like some we we'll, that's the last time we see him, right? Until the end when they're going through it all again is when he says squeeze his hand off or whatever. Uh Reggie says, "What happened to your Mahal and Drive poster, the Cameron that, that I had in the background?" I still have it. It's just not this way. It's 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 <laughs> this this way. I was going to say, I saw it when you did your DVD unboxing. It's in one of the corners. <laughs> well, here, I'll flip it around real quick. Oops, there's my Mulholland Drive and Straight Story, go. Straight Story poster. Oh, you have a Straight Story poster. Oh yeah. Well, I used to manage a movie theater where these movies played, <laughs> so I always take the posters. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's where it is. Everybody, relax. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a lot of the the same <clears throat> folks over here. It's all the same people that watch like all of our podcasts. Yeah, like, it's, it's so funny because. Sometimes they have like really great comments about stuff in the, in our, in, on our videos. And then other videos I go on and I realize, my God, they've just been copying and pasting the same comment and leaving on all of our videos. <laughs> I noticed that too with I, certain like people. I, like, I, like I thought that was like an original comment just for me, but no. Emma's got one, you got one, everyone, Pete Peppers has one. Like we all have one, the same comment. I'm like, come on, give us each an original comment. They just want, they want answers. <laughs> they want one answer. They want all it all. Us. They want it all. Yeah, I haven't yeah. thought about the evolution of the arm. Nor should you. I, yeah, I guess. I guess thinking the, about it at all is giving it too much. <laughs> no, because it would have been cooler if Michael J. Anderson had popped out of a sidewalk saying "squeeze his hand off." That would have shocked us all. It would have. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just the, the fact that he's there. I'm, like, I think um, if Michael J. Anderson had been in this show. I think they would have utilized him more than the tree. You know, I, I think he would have been like, you know, when, uh, like, instead of seeing like the, you know, Dougie seeing the, uh, the red, 
draped or whatever the green thing on 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 Tom Sizemore's face. Maybe mm-hmm. Michael J. Anderson was like dancing on the on the conference table and stuff. You know, that, like he like looks to the left and he's just yeah, <laughs> he's just there <laughs> doing his little his little groove, little jazz groove. Totally, totally. <sighs> Oh, tulpa. I haven't said the word tulpa in a while. <laughs> good, good. Let's get rid of that word. <laughs> Jason said this. I, 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 I will tell you one thing. <laughs> the Annie Blackburn chapter will stop this complete nonsense that she was a product of the Lodge, God. that she was a tulpa, that the Black Lodge created her to stop that nonsense. No. I always saw her as the antithesis, like the anti-Black Lodge in Twin Peaks. There's no, there's, she's an angel. <laughs> no, 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 no lodge made her. Okay. Yeah. Um, and people are like, well, no, she, cause she, she flips places with Caroline in the, in the black lodge of so the black. No, the black lodge was using Cooper's old relationship and his new relationship to try to trick him. Mm-hmm. End of story. That's one. I got that the first viewing. I never thought anything else of that. <laughs> but, okay. You know, you, you know where it comes down to? Cause people don't like Annie. And they want they wanted an Audrey Cooper relationship. And I remember before the new series started, I'm sure you heard this too. Everyone's like, "Oh, thank God, we're gonna get these hot, steamy sex scenes between Cooper and Audrey." And I remember thinking, "Listen, Why? Why if did... it well, my, but what I was thinking was, Lynch may give us a lot. He will never give us Cooper and Audrey ever because Cooper already made the decision not to be with Audrey. Oh, yes, but she's older now, and so you know." They didn't even even flirt with that idea. No, they didn't touch it at all. He was, I mean, we know we know now that he was hot for Diane. <laughs> he was he he was he, 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 he was hot he was hot for Diane. Second time a white woman you know came out of a uh, uh, an Asian person in the series. <sighs> uh, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> What are you doing, Lynch? What are you doing there? I don't know. I mean, like, couldn't Nido just be Nido? Why'd she have I to really turn? Want, I really wanted her to be her own thing. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. That it doesn't. Diane, you know, like, how about how about after Bob is, you know, gotten rid of, um, Diane just shoots back into our reality because, you know, all the tulpas were set free from, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, from, I figured that's what was going to happen, but. Right. But she came out of Nido. I'm that like, was, I'm still. Uh, well, and, you know, and like what happened to zombie dude, you know, they brought everybody else up to the top of the sheriff station, but they left zombie dude down there. Oh, yeah. he, never, he, he wasn't in the room. Then a lot of people will speculate that zombie guy is a, you know, a figment of deputy Chad's imagination and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, are we really thinking that deeply about deputy Chad and his, <laughs> and his mind state? Please say we're not. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for investigating and looking into all details, but deputy Chad, no, that's fine. He can just stay where he is. He was eating his lunch in the conference room for Christ's sake. It's a no, no. Can we explain why um, <laughs> Sheriff Truman's office grew four times too big <laughs> in the finale where well, 35 people could fit into a doorway? The, the, whole, the whole, the whole, the size of the, of the sheriff station in general is confusing to me in season three, especially with that whole back room full well, of that- well, I think it's quite apparent to me is uh, Frank Truman keeps uh, Lucy, Andy, and Hawk around just because of his brother, and he has the real sheriff station in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why Hawk wouldn't be a part of that real sheriff station because he's awesome. I agree, but maybe he's too uh, mystical. Mystical. Well, magical. Well, let, well, let's throw it the other way. Could it have been awesome if um, let's say Michael Hawking doesn't come back? And I understand, like, like, I'm not complaining about Robert Forster again. I think he's great. Yeah. But why don't we just get rid of him and get rid of the nagging wife and let's just make Hawk the sheriff. Solves that's a easy. lot. That's solves easy. a lot. Solves a lot of issues. Um, makes sense why he calls everybody into the conference room for a meeting to talk about Margaret dying. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things in there that make it cool. I would have loved to see Hawk as the sheriff. So, like, maybe the log lady talks to Hawk as the sheriff saying, you know, we're coming up on the anniversary of Cooper going into the lodge. Why don't you make sure that things are still okay, that the doors are still closed? And maybe every year Hawk goes up there, you know, like, see right there. It's just it's just kind of interesting. 
<laughs> now, now I'm thinking of that world. You, you saw me go away for a second. <laughs> no, I would. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. Especially if they do more, it's gonna be a little. It's gonna be a little empty without a, our log lady there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I her parts were were so significant, small but significant. Yeah. In the season, I don't know. Um. No, I don't think I'll go there. Uh, I love I love Kathleen E. Coulson. She was a wonderful person. Uh, I love David Lynch. I love his way of is using the log lady. I think her scenes, um, very powerful stuff. Um, of course. But what did they bring? to this series besides just very like um, like sad emotions like like what did the log lady contribute to this season (laughs) i'm just asking i'm just asking i mean uh listen i'm happy those scenes are there i'm happy she's there i'm not complaining about that i'm just saying that though some of those scenes because it was really hard because Every time we saw her, we thought, oh, this is the last time we're going to see Catherine Nicholson play the log lady. Mm-hmm. So we went through this whole mourning process. And then another episode would show up and she'd show up again. And it was like, oh, my God, another Catherine Nicholson moment. And then we have to go through the mourning process again. And then it, she surprised us again with more. And I remember thinking, this has to be going somewhere. Right. I, thought, I think that that's what made it feel so much more important. And there was really no payoff for those scenes. I mean. I, I don't know. There's again, fire I, where you're going and all this stuff. Again, I think it just has to do with the whole series where things are just kind of happening, you know, and there's no like rhyme or reason for it. Just kind of, you know, things start and, and, and we come in the middle of it and then we don't see the ending of it. It's just kind of really, uh, yeah. they're just like little fragments of time, uh, which is cool, which is cool. Um, but, you know, she was given very long dramatic monologues that she killed. I thought she was great in them. I'm just saying that Hawk played really no role in this series, especially towards the end. So what do her speeches to Hawk ultimately do in this series? Except just lend some um, some meditation time. But it almost felt like, I could be wrong, but it almost did feel like Hawk was entertaining the log lady by just letting her just call and say mm, her random stuff to him as okay. opposed to Okay. Like, no, I mean, he wasn't like shoving her off the phone, but I, 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 I don't think he was like really taking in like everything she was saying. I think he's mm-hmm. been hearing this for 25 years. So he's just kind of like, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. I think yeah. I thought so too. I got that feeling just with the way, like the way look, he acted. Look, I okay. love, I, I love the log lady. I'm, I'm glad they did what they did. I'm not complaining about that. Okay, now if I could have worked my wonders and 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 thrown out something, right? And again, I'm sure people will be upset with me about saying this. I would have taken I, I I would have had all those scenes out of the series if I could have and I would have had Lynch direct log lady introductions for all the episodes instead. And I would have had her alone, like so it matches up with the Bravo version, of course, which is on the Blu-ray set, which got mm-hmm. remastered in HD. And I would have loved to have Catherine E. Coulson at the start of every episode telling us a little hint about what we were going to watch. And a little poetry there, because that ultimately would have tied back into the re-airing of the original series. And it also would have allowed Catherine to be a part of the entire series. Mm-hmm. And they actually, just shot it in one day. And... Well, I mean, they shot the other. I mean, again, I mean, I'm glad we got what we got, but I, I, I would have loved to have seen her do these kind of introductions for the whole thing, even if she wasn't even a part of the series, right? Just the introduction is just the log lady is always there to greet us at the oh, beginning yeah. of each episode. I, I think that would have just that would have just knocked my socks off. I mean, if we saw that, if, if we got like the episode was going to start, it came with like a little parental warning. And then suddenly we just get like, sort of like a wind. And then Margaret 
sitting there leading us into the first episode and we know subsequently she's going to do that i think that impact would have been even and even though the first two episodes were so great and so impactful it would have been just a moment <laughs> yeah stephanie says nothing happened in twin peaks was relevant hawk didn't find cooper hawk never went anywhere that there was fire and cooper was going to twin peaks no matter what <laughs> Well, I mean, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I mean, he, I mean, no one got him out of the lodge. He kind of just fell out. I mean, yeah, he got tossed out, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so it, it it is it is what it is. And what repercussion repercussions were were there for them both being out at the same time? There really wasn't any. Well, we don't really know that. I mean, I I kind of the way I look at it as all that time displacement through the entire series is, uh, you know. Cooper having saved Laura and it's already, you know, fragmenting time. Mm -hmm. And then I also look at it as well, since the doppelganger's out, the Black Lodge has influence and especially over Twin Peaks where Glastonbury Grove was. And that's why there's this darkness that's always around, you know, with the, uh, the kid vomiting in the car mm -hmm. and all, you know, the other kid shooting the gun through their diner and all that. I just feel like there's just, um, uh, you know, like like the way Lynch would always okay. If you ever seen like the Art Life or or David Lynch talks about you know we never talks about Philadelphia or even Marietta Fortune and and Wild Heart. He always talks about how this person is dying inside or Philadelphia was so dark and it was it was dying inside. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel like he thinks about Twin Peaks, the town in the series. I think he feels like there's darkness and it's dying inside. Mm -hmm. So it just you know. Like, like I, I heard this the other day. Um, uh, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, uh, uh, there's the podcast uh, on YouTube, Twin Peaks Coffee Time. And the host of it, uh, James, said, there's, all, there's, only, there's only a little bit of goodness in this series. And one of it was like, uh, um, um, what's the, 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 um, the lady who loves the pies? Um, oh, I, for, I, for, I forgot. Oh, I totally forgot her name. Sorry. Um, but yeah, we got her. She really loves pies. And how does Lynch reward her? Clubs her over the head. <laughs> was it Marion? No, right? Yeah, yeah, something like yeah, something like that. But I thought that was absolutely... It's so true. It's like, <laughs> here's a character. She's like, I love pies. I'm going to buy a pie for you, Shelly and, and, and Heidi. And then, um, then she just gets clubbed over the head several times by Richard Horn and left for dead and has to crawl through the weeds. It's like, you know, and Ben Horn's going to pick up the tab. Just so the, you know. the dichotomy of this, what I thought was super interesting. I think I, I said this on maybe oh, yeah, one Miriam, of Miriam, Miriam. Okay. Miriam, yeah. I thought, I thought it was super interesting that twin peaks, this like supposed to be folksy, like cute, you know, everybody knows each other kind of town is like sick and evil. And the two people with the hearts of gold are like these two casino moguls in Las Vegas. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. And now knowing what, how like they approached the writing of a lot of this in 2008 or 2009 uh, as a response to that, it's interesting that he made, well, they didn't write in 2009. They were, well, they approached, yeah, they approached it with that. Sort yeah. of. It's interesting that Mark Frost and David Lynch created the Mitchum brothers. <laughs> I'm not, you know what though? I like the Mitchum brothers because they're the complete antithesis of what I assumed Robert Nepper and James Belushi as gangsters would be like. <laughs> I honestly thought we were going to get another Mr. Eddie type. Um, and it looked like we were going to go that way when they start beating up that guy in the back room. Mm -hmm. um, but they become the moment they find out that Dougie, that they're not going to kill Dougie. Right. Right there. And then they become like the, one of the audience's favorite characters. I know I love. The I think I think before that we're like, okay, they're they're cool, they're entertaining, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. But the moment we get that like rec recreation of David Fincher Seven out in the desert with Dougie in the box, um, it 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 they all of a sudden just become because once they get on Dougie's side, they're a hundred and ten percent on Dougie's side. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna mess with Dougie. I love know? that. And I actually thought the Mitchum brothers were going to end up taking out uh, Hutch and Chantel. I thought that's where we were going to go. I nobody expected that like Russian mobster dude to show up and just take them all out. I love that out. scene so oh, much. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. Oh man! But, but I'm just saying nobody predicted that. Ugh. 
I, I definitely did it. And when it, I was like, what? What is happening right now? You're parked in my driveway. No, we're not. <laughs> and then all out war. Oh, yeah, completely. It was it was fantastic. And I love the Mitchum brothers watching and then saying, you know, wow, people are really, people you know, are really stressed, stressed out. out. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect. Really, really stressed out, Bradley. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just the, the tension of everyone pulling up, and and then finally the big gunfight in the streets, and the and the FBI showing up, and then the guy laying down his gun and surrendering with that big, you know, the crane shot. It's like that is perfect. That is a perfect example of when uh, we expect Lynch to zig and he zags. The problem is with Lynch is sometimes he needs to zig when the audience needs him to zig, it doesn't always work to zag. Yeah. It's great. It's great to like, we, th- we, we think, Oh, it's gonna, he's going to go this way. No, he surprises us this way. But every once in a while, you kind of have to give people what they want. You can't always give them the opposite. I mean, one thing we could be sure of almost at this point is the bad guys are going to get what they, what's coming to them in these shows and his work. Yeah, I mean the only the I mean really the only character arc that goes all the way through is Cooper, mm-hmm. right? Everybody else gets like individual pop up moments. Nobody else gets like a a full arc all the way yeah. through. I mean, yeah, you can say well, a character's here, and then a character ends up here. Yeah, I guess theoretically it's an arc, but I'm talking about where it moves through the whole series. There's none of that. Only I, only Cooper does. I mean, yeah, I would. When I say Cooper, I mean Cooper, Dougie, Mister C, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, the Coopers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess you could sort of look at it as just like a Cooper's story. It is. Just it's everything is put in place for him to act. At right. That. And again, I'm not complaining of the fact that like we we popped in and out of a character's lives and stuff. That's that's fine. But what I'm saying though is, uh, Mark Frost's book, The Final Dossier, uh, uh, it it helps clarify some things about s- some of these characters, like recent past and that type of thing, that could have very easily been incorporated without changing much of the series. You know, like. You know, when Bobby puts James in the holding cell, why don't we have just kind of a nice moment of James, Bobby, (laughs) you know, because this is where these two, we kind of saw them for the first time in the pilot bark when Bobby Bray's barking at James early in the, in the holding cell. Now Bobby's putting James in a holding cell. That's cool. Let's have them just say Bobby, James, something, just something. Five seconds and then boom, we're out. But just acknowledge the past. I mean, why doesn't Bobby say, "We got Laura's picture here. We're investigating my da- my dad in this chair. Now James is in the holding cell." Shouldn't Bobby, being this like so hot was, shot yeah. detective, be like something? Is Laura Palmer coming back? You know what I mean? Like, why is this all coming up now? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it's just something to think about. Um, and, and that's why, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I understand like the, uh, you know, and one issue they had also with writing the script is that, you know, they made sure that every scene was individualized so that they could just give the actor that scene or their lines and it mm-hmm. wouldn't interfere with the entire plot. If somebody did spill the beans, um, but the problem, I mean, look, look how loyal everybody is with Lynch, right? With this whole thing, like without Lynch, there's no Twin Peaks. Well, if this is the way they feel, then trust them with the character I arc. Agree, Jesus, don't I don't just say, preach. Um, uh, Dana Ashbrook, here's your scene for this. What is this about? I don't know, Dana. Stare in that car and let a kid puke on you. You know, I mean, it's just like okay, like it's cool, it works, but at the same time, though. Dan Ashbrook had, you know, when he had that look on his face, he probably was thinking that like, he probably was like, how the hell did Bobby Briggs end up here? <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't really watch that scene again without cracking up. I don't know. The lady yelling in yeah, the car that's cracks funny. me the hell up. Oh yeah. No, it's <laughs> fun. <laughs> I just, I can't, it kills me every time. Right. Her face, just looking over, not doing anything about it except screaming. Mm-hmm. 
No, it, to- it totally it totally works. Me. It totally works. But I wish I wish there had been you know just a little bit more, a little bit more of a. Why you is know, this kid sick? Well, no, no, I don't care about that. I just, I mean, there could have been a little bit more with uh, Bobby and Shelly with, with with Becky and stuff like that. Especially no, since there was, I don't need, I don't need Shelly hopping on the car like the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> okay, can we just like have a nice moment between mother and daughter? She has a gun, Bobby. I mean, I th- I felt like it was a weird setup to get her in the scene with Carl Rod. I don't know. Because you know what though, I just I thought it was really weird because I'd heard about them filming the scene of Machin Hammock jumping on the car. Mm-hmm. Then when you see the scene, she literally jumps on the car. It's not like <laughs> Becky turns left with like like the like Isabella Rossellini Wild the Heart and like knocks Shelly onto the car. No. Shelly literally like... jumps <laughs> jumps on the car and I'm like, okay, Daisy Duke, what what are you doing here? What are you I trying mean, to do? Yeah, what did you think you were gonna accomplish with this? I don't know. And then she like flies off with the shoes. It's like hilarious to me. <laughs> oh man. But, my, but I, I still have to say that like my, one of my favorite memes that went around during the whole time was like, every time someone pitches about twin peaks, <laughs> David Lynch cuts an Audrey Horn awesome, scene. Yeah. <laughs> That's just so funny to me. Cause yeah, cause Stephanie in the chat totally agree. Um, she says, uh, feels like sometimes they made two shows, one about Cooper and one about Twin Peaks, but Twin Peaks had all the scenes deleted. <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna be the next uh, the next thing they put out. And I agree. Most people assume during the filming of the Shelley scene with Carl Rod that Carl Rod was gonna end up being her dad. Mm-hmm. And um, I was kind of expecting it too a little bit. And that would have been okay. That would have been okay because let's be honest here, Shelley does seem like somebody who would would have been raised in a trailer park. The Mary Leo Johnson out of high school, mm-hmm. and especially after reading that first part of the fi- her part of the final dossier, we know she's her upbringing was a little yeah, not great. It, it, it would have worked. It would have worked, and it actually would have explained. Not that I mean, listen, I understand we don't need an explanation, but we kind of do. Um, it would have explained why Carl Rod would up the whole trailer park to Twin Peaks. Maybe mm-hmm. he was getting older and he wanted to be closer to his daughter and granddaughter. And so he allowed <laughs> Becky to live there rent free. Like see, see, see how, see how you could have just a little tweak here and there. And it, 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 it's awesome. As of now, you're like, why is Carl Rod? Why did Carl Rod bring the, the motor, the, you know, the mobile home park to Twin Peaks? Uh, <laughs> It, you know what? The, see, the thing is, if you tied it in with Shelly, you tied it in with Becky, that makes a, there's a foundation of, of 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 truth and sense to it. Okay, as it is the way it plays now, and again, I like it. Don't get me wrong, but the way it plays now is Lynch said, "I'm bringing Harry Dean into this. Fit him in, Frost. Let's uproot him from Portland." Yeah. Yeah, and that's all it is because there's there's really no point of Carl Rod being in this series except just to have Harry Dean Stanton in this series. Yeah, but if you had tied it in where Shelley was the daughter, Becky was the granddaughter, and he, again, you don't have to add a lot of scenes to it. It could be just like a sentence or two of, of like, well, you well, you, well, you know, honey, you know, I I, 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 I let Becky stay here rent free because you know, I don't want her living on the streets with Stephen. Mm-hmm. Okay, Ooh, what'd that take? Five seconds. Wow. But it, but it would have impacted a lot of us. Yeah, and then there's a whole reason why, I mean, maybe they were, they were disconnected and he decided now that he was older, there's that whole thing you could have done where he's older, trying to reconnect with his daughter and his granddaughter, stuff like that. Because he, And when we see him in Fire Walk with me, he's kind of just like sort of bitter and alone. And then all of a sudden he's this, don't, I don't like people selling their blood to eat kind of type. Right. He's Almost a like totally... A different character. He's a completely different character. But again, you could say 25 years later, you yeah. know, what, whatever. Actually, it's, it's like 26 years later. 20, but, uh, 26, 26. Because Teresa Banks is the year before. But um, so, I mean, that uh, I don't know. I mean, like, it works. It works. I'm just saying that, like, do you see how easily you could just tweak a teeny little bit and all of a sudden the series actually uh, becomes even more profound? Mm-hmm. I don't I agree. know. No, I agree. And and that's not the George Lucas effect where it's like, okay, we got to have all these characters be related to each other. It's not that at all. It's just it's just it's finding the connections. It's finding the details 
that would make it feel more like a community. That's mm -hmm. the big issue I have with the new series. Again, and again, it's not a complaint. It's just, it's, but it is an issue because in the original series, it was all about community. Even when Leland Palmer died, everybody had a wake, yeah. right? For a serial rapist, serial killer. They all got together and had a wake for him. Think about that as a community. It's pretty profound. In this new series, how often was a character in the room with another character? It was pretty much everybody in standalone scenes mm -hmm. or they met up for like one little moment and then, and then we never paid off and it never would pay off. Um, so it just, it just was like, we're going to have this actor do this. We're going to have this actor do this. And David Lynch looks at David E. Kelly and says, you know what we're going to do, David? We're just going to go get ourselves lost in the woods. What do you think about that? <laughs> and we're going to shoot like an hour's worth of footage and I'm just going to use the best parts. And, and there it is. I mean, it's like, like the Jerry Horn stuff. Is it funny? Sure. Is it amusing? Sure. Does it look like it was completely filmed one off weekend with just Lynch and David E. Kelly, just Roman in the woods, like to Peter Demi, the cinematographer, Peter set up that shot. All right, Jerry uh, run. Okay, good. We yeah. got it. Like there's no, point <laughs> is it amusing sure is it entertaining sure yeah D should it have been completely excised from the material perhaps because there's no <laughs> i wouldn't have minded if we knew we were going to get more like sure let's have these wacky scenes with jerry if if we're getting a season five maybe but, but we'll can see we, more but can, but can we have a wacky yeah. scene that works more than a wacky scene like for instance okay I know a lot of people compl complain about the Civil War stuff in season I two. I love that stuff. But, but Ben Horn, even though it's completely ridiculous and silly, we know why this is happening. He's mm -hmm. working through his ordeal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying you have to have a complete you know, psychological basis for what going, was going on with Jerry Horn, but maybe, maybe a payoff of something. Like when he's looking through the binoculars – realizing that's his nephew dying on the rock you know i mean yeah just something the only thing i got from the jerry horn scenes were that drugs were bad and they make you look like a fool like that's the only thing the only thing i took from from that i don't know i, I mean i mean again it's like is it entertaining is it amusing sure but it's like the problem is with this new season is because so many plot threads went nowhere, right? It makes it harder for a lot of people to rewatch because how do you get invested in something that you know is just really nothing? Mm -hmm. right? and, and again, I understand the journey is everything, but now that we've taken the whole journey, well, you, you need to, you need to make it so people want to take the journey again. Right. So does there have to be like huge payoffs for everything? No, but there should be some sort of idea as to why we're watching what we're watching. Yeah. Not right? that you just wanted to film this kooky scene and put it in there because you thought it was... but Lynch always has those kind of kooky scenes, but he's always figured out a way um, to blend it into mm -hmm. the movie. So it feels like a coherent whole and not just like, well, we just shot this extra moment and here you go. The yeah. problem is the whole series at times felt like we were getting deleted scenes just stitched together. <laughs> right? I definitely, I definitely felt that. On uh, looking back, looking back, maybe yeah. not at the not when you're watching at the time. Oh, no. At the time there's like a weird high you're on and you're just absorbing. Yeah, but looking but, back, you're like, yeah. yeah. So when I hear, like I said, I like, you know, would use the poo poo fan edits and stuff like that. But when people have said to me, like, I could probably cut this series into a good five hour tight film. I'm like, yeah, you could easily. You could. Would you lose a lot? Sure. Um, would you strengthen the material by bringing all the good stuff closer together? Yes. Now, that, 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 
and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I love a lot of the non sequiturs and, 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 and silliness and stuff like that. I enjoy a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying that there's, there's, there's just a few things in there that you go. Okay. If you had done this with Jerry Horn, if you had done this little thing over Carl rod and just kind of connected her, him with Shelly, that doesn't, do away with the mystery of the material. It actually strengthens the material. And it would make, listen, if you knew Carl Rod was Shelly Johnson's dad and, and, and that's why he had Becky stay there and that type of thing, that would give you the momentum to go through those scenes again, because you're mm -hmm. looking at the connections between the characters. And you're not looking at just randomness. Yeah. It doesn't, there, there would still be some mystery. There would be new mystery there. It wouldn't. T I don't. I don't think it would take away from it. I, I agree with you. Reggie says weed has never made me run hundreds of miles. <laughs> I don't think it was only weed that he was taking. No, no, and he ran like nine hundred miles across like two into states with, or whatever. Into like Wisconsin. That was the end of his story. He was naked in Wisconsin. Right, right. Now, let me throw out another question to you. Do you think? Okay, now I have no basis for this, but I just think it's a funny concept. Okay. <laughs> do you think that two-thirds of the way through shooting, do you think they ran out of money? And the reason why I bring that up <laughs> is, it, it, is how long are Tammy, Albert, and Gordon stuck in that hotel room in Buckhorn? <laughs> uh the latter half of the se season okay so would you would you think that maybe some of those scenes some of them were to take place other places i'm sure and, and they they were running out of money so they said we need to just put this all in like the hotel bar and the and the hotel room because mm -hmm. that's the vibe i'm getting when i look at those scenes i'm like they're stuck in buckhorn for like eight episodes straight Right. And I understand they're, they're waiting around to hear about Cooper and stuff, but you know, I've, I've heard other people say, uh, you know, people have contacted me before to say, wouldn't it have been cooler if Bill Hastings, the Matthew Lillard character had been the principal of twin peaks high. And that when Gordon, Albert and Tammy, instead of going to Buckhorn, they're stationed in twin peaks the entire season. So then when Cooper shows up, they're already there in play. Mm -hmm. And then you could have Albert dealing with Frank Truman and all that stuff. Yeah, that I mean, would that would have been that, that, that would have been amazing, and that would have already put Diane there at the red curtains and all that stuff. You know, we could have had awesome scenes of Diane, you know, acting weird as a tulpa, standing outside Glastonbury Grove, and and us debating for weeks like, what is she doing out there? She doing some kind of seance, and then we realize that she's waiting for Cooper and all that. You know. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that, yeah, they, they could have moved it all. They could have moved it all from Buckhorn to Twin Peaks. But I think there was a part on Mark Frost and David Lynch's, you know, a part to, dare I say, make a Twin Peaks show that had little to do with Twin Peaks. I see that. I, I don't think they wanted to go back to Twin Peaks. And in fact, I think that from what I understand, the first two hours never had any Twin Peaks in it. And they had to go back and kind of maybe add some stuff or, or they just did it in post and start bringing stuff in. But I don't think they really wanted to, I mean, I, I think they wanted to use the Twin Peaks name to do a lot of other stories, which we've mm -hmm. kind of theorized about, but yeah, that would have been amazing if they, if they, all those characters had been in Twin Peaks and the only time we went out outside of Twin Peaks was a deal with Dougie. And no, I definitely, I felt that going all the way through. I felt that it, it def, Twin Peaks is definitely like it started off as the town, but it's becoming just the show about like these supernatural kind of things. How much you want to bet Showtime creates a show called the Blue Rose Mysteries? I think if there's I honestly, if we don't get more Twin Peaks, I think there's going to be a spinoff. Yeah. Well, let me throw this out to you. Why was Teresa Banks the Blue Rose case? I still can't figure this out. I mean, because I don't know. There's no reason for it. She was yeah, clubbed no over one. the head with a pipe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't and, and you could say, well, okay, there was a whole thing with the Al Cave ring and, and, the, and the thing disappearing. Yes, but Gordon introduced it to Chet Desmond as a Blue Rose case. With Lil. Yeah. 
Right. So this was before they had known about the the Al Cave ring and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah, I could. I honestly, I see, I see something else. Maybe if they don't even do Twin Peaks, it's just something in that world. Which is not do you know Twin what Peaks. it would have been great though? I mean, Fire Walk with Me. Obviously, it uh, exists, but I could. I would have loved to have seen a season of Twin Peaks because I mean, they could have done it like Fargo, the series. You know, each series tells a different story. I would have loved to have seen a season of them investigating Teresa Banks. That would have been cool. I would have been yeah. up for that. You know, that would have that would have been a great like just season of television. Even if we'd known the answer, I mean, we know the answer is Leland, but they could have really gotten into the whole Leland cheating on Sarah and all that stuff. I mean, come on, they already had Cheryl Lee come back as Laura Palmer this new season. We could have, you know, Laura be alive during the whole thing, and you know, I mean, they could they really could do it. They that would have been great. Now, now talking about this, I'm seeing that they, they, there is a huge hole open, and they could fill it with really anything they want. I think there's this, there's there's so much, and that and that's why I get really upset when people say only David Lynch can direct Twin Peaks because I I think that listen the universe is so big in this in this in this character right, he universe. Could, he could direct Twin Peaks. Let's be technical here. He could direct anything called Twin Peaks. Let people play outside. In the world, but outside of Twin Peaks. <laughs> I, well, I think well, I just think that the the world is too rich to just come back to it every twenty years, and you know. I agree. I, I just I don't know. I just I just do. Um, and, and maybe it's just because I, I see possibilities of like, well, there's a there's a there's a hole that you could tell a story that wouldn't interfere with anything, but it would be a nice isolated thing. I mean, I know they already did the Teresa Banks thing, so that's not going to happen, but. Um, that would have been cool. I mean, you know my original idea for the back half of season two, right? I don't remember. Well, how do you? Me. Well, you know, a lot of people complain about the back half of season two, right? Because the Laura Palmer mystery. Oh, you, yeah. Okay, I think I remember. Right. You telling me. My 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 thing looking back is, I mean, even though I love the whole Wyndham Earl thing, um, if you just took out, if you erased that entire back half, and instead of um, then after the solving of Laura's murder at the end of episode 16, when we came back, it opened up with Laura Palmer walking down the sidewalk and Donna. And now the back half of season two is fire walk with me in which we see Laura interacting with all of the characters of the series. And it ends with her dying. Hmm. But that wouldn't, don't you think that would have been an, like sort of an end note to Twin Peaks if they did it that way? Perhaps, but what a way to go out. I know, yeah. If, like if they, if they knew, if they knew that's how it was going to go, if they knew they were going to get canceled, I, I would, that would have been perfect. Well, it just would have been great because I think Fire Walk With Me, like I said, I, one problem I have with it is it's, it's too short. That's why I like the fan edit so much because it mm -hmm. does kind of incorporate a lot of the other facts and, and uh, characters into it at least. Um, but yeah, but fire walk with me stretched out for, you know, 10 episodes. Yeah. That would have done it justice. Plus you would have had all the actors there, all the sets there. You could have brought back Ray wise. Mm -hmm. He never would have had to go anywhere. Ray wise. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say it before I'll say it again. If there's one thing that completely sucks huge in season three is the lack of Ray Wise. I am a hundred percent on with you there. Jesus. Like we had we had Philip Gerard saying, Don't die, don't die. Why couldn't we have Leland Palmer showing up and saying stuff? Because I think Leland should have been guiding Cooper too. Or Dougie. Yeah. Fine Laura. Come on. Just give us something more than that twice at different angles. Or not the same. It was sort of just like a reverse of that. I think it was shot angle. at the same time with two different cameras. Yeah. And then they said, thank you, Ray. I know you did a lot for Twin Peaks over the last 25 years. Go. <laughs> you can leave now. You're good. You're good. You're, that's a wrap on Ray Wise. <laughs> Season wrap on Ray Wise. <laughs> that's it. Just give him the fanfare. With... Oh, my God. It's terrible. I mean, he is. Look, he's great on everything. He's even great on Fresh Off the Boat. Have you ever watched that show? Yeah. He is fantastic <laughs> on Fresh Off the Boat. And, uh, you know, I remember, I, you know, I've met him a couple of times. He's a super nice guy. He likes a lot of 
my tweets and retweet stuff. And I mean, he's just, he's a fantastic guy. Um, yeah, he, he, he needs to be in it more. I feel like Back he could have been such a huge thing, especially after his role in the between two worlds thing on the Blu-ray. I thought Lynch was really going to give him something big. It, it, I'm so bitter about it. Cause I, I love Ray wise so much. And I think ugh. the only, the only thing that I can possibly think of. And I, and I don't believe it for one second, but this is the only thing I can grasp onto is that um, he couldn't he he couldn't arrange his schedule to be there more because he's too busy oh, doing all these other shows. That's the only thing I can think of. That being said, I think Ray Wise would have restructured his schedule to be there more. <laughs> I agree. Right. I feel like so, he, yeah, I think he loves Twin Peaks. So yeah. Um. Yeah, Dan- Danielle in the chat says she loves him on Fresh Off the Boat. Oh, hey, too. Danielle, what's up? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, that just gets me depressed about Ray. I know. Wars. So <laughs> let's try not to think about it too much. Oh man, I mean, there's always season four or whatever, whatever's next. Look, I think there is. Look, I, I just, I, I, I do believe there's going to be a lot more coming. I do. Um, and that's not just me to wishful thinking. They completely set it up at the end of, uh, of, of it. Um, now a lot of people would say like, no, they don't, but they kind of do. Um, cause there's like just so many things like, why, why are you showing this to me? Lynch? Like this doesn't make mm-hmm. any narrative or logical sense at this moment. Why are you showing me this? Like for instance, Laura's body disappears from the beach. Right, we see uh, Pete Martell walk out, and now the body is not there on the beach, and it's a wonderful moment. One, it gets yeah, Jack, it's... it gets Jack Nance into the show. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. We see him actually fishing instead of having to stop That's everything. <laughs> right, right. We see him, you know, actually, you know, he goes fishing. He doesn't have to stop everything and and, and report the body. Okay, that's great. Now explain to me why we get two cutaway shots from the pilot of Josie Packard in that section. That that's so. Still boggles my mind now i get it in the original series i do not understand it in this series okay that 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 says there's more to explore there yeah and i and i, and I definitely even though the, the ringing thing is in the hospital as well but i i do think the ringing thing is some sort of otherworldly thing which could still be josie mm-hmm. um all right, they show Jack Nance talking to Piper Laurie briefly, you know, gone fishing. Um, but uh, again, didn't, we didn't need to see it. When Cooper um, shows up and, and, and Laura's talking to James, they could have easily stayed on Cooper for a little bit and then cut in and out of the Laura James conversation for little little moments here and there and just kind of wrap it up. Mm-hmm. No, they let they let that scene play, and and they laid left in the line. Even Donna doesn't know me. Okay, pretty much the f- first mention of Donna Hayward in this whole movie, right? In the flashback to Firewalk with me. Um, although we do get to see her in the picture with Laura when Sarah slash Judy yeah. knocks over the pictures. She's they're the only picture that stays up is the Laura and Donna picture, and then um um. We get uh, her saying to James, Bobby killed a guy. Right. Why leave that in there? Why leave that into this this movie? I get Firewalk with me, but this movie, they could have just cut to Cooper during that line where we don't hear it and then cut back and have her go, I think you want to take me home now. Mm-hmm. But they left in the line of uh, Bobby killed a guy. Well, okay. Bobby didn't kill anybody. <laughs> exactly. So that says to me they're leaving open ends to explore. I really do think to this moment that when Bobby walks in the room and sees Laura Palmer's picture, yeah, it's overwhelming. All the emotions are coming back, but he's also thinking, holy crap, I shot a deputy who was tied to this girl. And if we're investigating this, that might open up. Like That would have been really cool to give Bobby like a little subplot where he's like trying to bury evidence of Laura Palmer because he doesn't want it to come back to him. Like, ooh, isn't that giving Dana Ashbrook something to do? I mean, if they were to, if they're doing a movie, if they're doing something else, that could be a huge thing. Cause that was, that's like 
I don't know. The, the the crowd isn't. I mean, the town isn't overwhelmed by the loss of Laura Palmer. Now there's just like a dead deputy. Well, not 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 anymore. I mean, I mean that was 25 years ago. But well, yeah. But like, I don't know. There there must have been some repercussions of that in those 25 years. So there you, there would be a different president. I mean, uh, president. Yeah, Bob. but we have but we have Cooper, and he's an upstanding lawman. Mm. who just overheard that a sheriff's deputy shot a sheriff's deputy. Yeah, that's what I mean. There would be just a very different result for Bobby in those 25 years. He wouldn't become a deputy probably or a sheriff. Unless, unless, I wonder if it would flip. Like maybe Laura wasn't there when Bobby was trying to score the drug slash baby laxatives and maybe the sheriff's deputy killed Bobby in this new world. Maybe when we come back, Bobby will be dead and it, 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 will, it will have flipped. And, and Shelly is still with, with Leo. Woo. I like that. That'd been awesome. Or Shelly's. I mean, if Bobby's gone, then I guess Shelly has nobody to pine after. So she probably just stays with Leo. And they probably have kids. <laughs> Imagine that. Some Leo Johnson show. <laughs> Leo Johnson babies. Imagine Leo and Jacques still running the roadhouse and all this. Oof. What a hell. We thought we thought we saw hell, but <laughs> No, it would be like the Biff Tannen universe and Back to the Future too. Uh-huh. Um we thought we were in the bad, the worst timeline, but it turns out. You know, you know what have been. You know what I thought was going to happen. I thought the Mitchum brothers were going to end up either buying the Great Northern, mm-hmm. um, or better, or better, they should have bought One Eye Jags. I would have loved to have seen Candy and the girls. Welcome to One Eye Jags. And it's like this, like really beautiful, almost like the restaurant they went to. Like just really done up well, maybe like gold everywhere, and mm-hmm. keep the red curtains, but just like have it be like a fancy ballroom kind of place. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I love it. Like a high end eatery in Twin Peaks, <laughs> something for people that don't quite want to go to the Double R, <laughs> the Mitchum's Bang Bang Bar, or whatever they decide to call them. Hey, now let's start just moving. Mitchum's. <laughs> Yeah, when I when, when I mention him, <laughs> if if Candy had just like missed by a couple inches, hey, let me, yeah. listen, you know, just for a second, let me just say this character we never talk about, but I think is one of the coolest, coolest people, and nobody ever ever cosplays her is Blackie. Mm. I think people forget about Blackie. But she is an awesome character. You know, maybe my next Twin Peaks Star of the Day video will be an ode to Blackie. Because <laughs> she's just wicked and cool. Yeah, I want to know more about Blackie. No, not, now that you're mad. Like, how did she get in these situations? How, how, who, who made her? Why is she the way she is? It looked like, you know, Ben Horn just put her in charge. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't feel like she was running One-Eyed Jacks and Ben Horn is just a, uh, you know, like, you know, I mean, he's the owner. Yeah, he's the owner. She's, you know, the manager. You know, it may may have been, may have been that she was, you know, if Carl Rod is the original bookhouse boy, then maybe Blackie was the original perfume girl at Horn's department store, and she just <laughs> worked her way up. I could see that. You know, that's pretty cool. Except she never, for some reason, she never succumbed to the same stuff Laura did, and uh, no, she was a, she was a drug addict though. But. <sighs> I, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, she was more of like, was it heroin? I think it was heroin. Yeah, it was heroin. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, I remember when, when Jean Renault just stabs her in the kiss and then he licks his lips when the blood comes out of her mouth. Oh, it's classy. And that's the, like, you know, that's the one moment where you see like Cooper and like violence towards women. He like punches out her sister right in the gut. You know, Blackie's sister tries to stab him and he grabs All her right. and just slugs her right in the, in the gut. <laughs> I forgot about that. Holy Jesus! <laughs> wow, I forgot about. And that. he gra- and he grabs her without even looking. He's like, uh-huh. "Look, 
he's like looking into Audrey's eyes all intensely. And then he just grabs her by the hand, turns around, just socks her right in the stomach. Holy crap. I haven't, I have to rewatch really that. And the, be, and, the, and the best part about that too, after that <laughs> is that, that that gunman has a gun on Sheriff on Truman and Cooper, and he's got Audrey on her back. And then all of a sudden Hawk throws the knife and kills that guard guy. Mm-hmm. The guy goes, goes down. And the best part, Hawk goes back and retrieves his knife. <laughs> Where's that? Where was that Hawk in season three? Yeah, I would have loved to have seen Hawk jump into the Black Lodge and start just just killing everybody. Oh my god, just full I'm on kill Cooper, <laughs> full kill Bill style. You know, just <laughs> chops down the tree. Oh my god. Tomahawks it. Woo! <laughs> that would have been. I sound nice. like who? Like just do put bring down the lodge altogether. Forget it. We don't oh yeah. <laughs> Um, we're getting a too, we're getting a little too crazy. No, Reggie says Blackie would be a basis for a great Lynch film, or even a great Twin Peaks movie. Stephanie says most of the people. Oh no, I'm sorry. Stephanie says uh, Blackie was tougher mentally than Laura, and Laura hated her dark side, and Blackie embraced it. Ah, right. Stephanie says most of the people Cooper gets in a physical fight with are women and, and little people. <laughs> And Reggie says Hawk it was too busy with stomach problems in season three. <laughs> he was in the bathroom a lot. It's all that, that black it. that black corn didn't sit well with uh with Hawk. I gotta say when when the, the doppelganger puked up the corn and the oil in that car, that was one of the best effects I had ever seen. It was so nasty and gross, and yet and yet chunky and, and yet I know this sounds silly. Perfect logical sense of what was presented in firewalk with me. If the Garmin Bosia is the cream corn, then mm-hmm. wouldn't it make sense that an agent of the lodge when he gets sick would puke up the cream corn mixed with the engine oil that everyone was smelling. And I thought that is a Lynch. I mean, sorry, it's a Mark Frost written touch, but that is a Lynch execution of it. Mm-hmm. And it was perfect. And that's when, that's when it it's beautiful. That's when it's perfect. And those yeah. two come together and like that kind of. Oh yeah. yeah! When I saw the black coming with the corn, I was like, "Yeah, yeah!" yeah. I was clapping. I was so <laughs> I was so excited. I was like, "Yes!" Because it felt like they were taking the material extremely seriously, having mm-hmm. fun with it, having fun with oh, it, yeah, of course. But still taking what they had presented to us as as a serious thing. Right. It wasn't like, welcome to Twin Peaks, have some coffee, have some pie. It was like, we are looking at the serious implications and ramifications of what we set up mm-hmm. in two movies and a movie, uh, two, uh, two series and a movie. And uh, I was just like, yeah. And then after part four, once Cooper became Dougie, and again, like I didn't mind the Dougie stuff. I know a lot of people did, but um, the, the problem with the Dougie stuff is, they thought it was really cute to have him come out in part three and go back as in part 15. All right. So the three fifteen connection. Mm-hmm. So we had to be stuck with Dougie for 12 episodes because they thought it was cute. <laughs> and you can tell they were kind of running out of material because as we were going on, we started getting less and less Dougie. We'd get that like one episode where he just threw where Sonny Jim throws the ball at him. And that's all we see. <laughs> that's all we see. So, yeah, uh, you know, so they thought it was a really cute idea, and it is a cute idea. The problem is that in execution, that means 12 episodes of Dougie. Now, the the other problem is, is that looking looking at what they created, they obviously didn't have a lot of story for Cooper once he was back. So they needed to stretch him out as long as possible, this Dougie thing. Because if he had come back in episode nine, there's no way there's not nine episodes worth of material for Cooper to do. Now you could say, well, they could have uh, created a story for Cooper. Oh yeah. yeah, They could have, but that's not what they wanted to do. So, you know, so you have to look at it as like, is it a little disappointing? It disappointing that we didn't get Cooper. Uh, like we remembered him in a way kind of solving some stuff. Yeah. It is a little disappointing to me, but at the same time though, that's not what they were trying to do at all. So I, so I have to look at it from their point of view. Did they succeed in doing what they wanted to do? Yes. 
does that still make it somewhat disappointing on other layers? Yes. Does it mean it's disappointing for me to watch the series as it is? No. I agree. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's very confusing. I almost felt like the, co- the, the Dougie they gave us was the Cooper they thought we wanted. Like the one that loves coffee and pie and is sort of, sort of goofy and, you know, boyish. But the, the Cooper they, the Cooper they wanted to bring us was Mr. C and then the Cooper we saw at the end. The more like the, the get out of the daytime like drama Cooper mm-hmm. type and get them into like you know cable Cooper like a little bit more hardcore and then we just but then we got Cooper at the end who didn't want coffee or pie he didn't even want to stay and say hi to anybody he just wanted to yeah drive to Odessa <laughs> as a thing it's like that it's just not they didn't want they didn't want that Cooper anymore. I know we did, but they didn't want it. Yeah. Over it. Well, yeah. I mean, the whole thing was kind of like, you know, some people think that this whole series was about Lynch knocking Cooper down and making him like just like a failure at everything. And I, I don't really see it that way, but um, but I can see where people would think that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't agree. I think that he, he, I mean, he succeeded. I mean, yes, him and Laura are trapped in another existence or whatever but um he did save laura and at least they're together as opposed to you know it's kind of the ending to fire walk with me they're together yeah, they're together in, in another plane of existence so at least at least they have each other i just i just keep waiting for the inevitable which is cooper and laura have sex which by the way was in the original script of fire walk with me was it? Yeah, the original screenplay of Firewalk with Me, it was not Annie in the bed, it was Cooper and him and Laura had sex. After that, that. so if they do another one, that's coming. Probably. Literally. <laughs> oh boy. I didn't know that. I'd never read the full I've never read the full thing. I've sort of just passed life. Well, it's not it's it. not in the script now that you read online. It's oh, okay. Yeah, but I've seen it next. I've seen an excerpt from it. Oh boy, that just made me really nervous because we'll probably get that if the if the, when they do more. I could see uh, that happening for sure. Phoenix says, Cameron, I think I heard you mention once that it's called the Return because it documents Cooper's return to this world. Well, actually, looking back, Showtime just called it the Return just to call it something. But I mean, it was kind of a a play on words. It was the Twin Peaks, the return of the series, but also it's about Cooper's return to, you know, becoming himself again. Yeah. You know, so it worked. I mean, it, it works for a lot of things. I'm kind of disappointed that it got left off the Blu-ray set. It's now just Twin Peaks, a limited event series. But again, like I said in my podcast the other day, I think they purposely did that so that it qualifies for the Emmys, not on all the TV shows, but the limited shows, so they have more of a chance of winning stuff. I'm curious if it's going to win anything. I, I think, I think, I think Kyle still has a chance of winning, but it all depends on how people react. Like, like for instance, if like if the ending had just been like without a doubt, just a massive hit with with everybody. Like, like wow, mm-hmm. that was a I mean, like, listen, I like the last scene, but I'm talking about the last two hours. If the last two hours had been, let's just say, like, just like the best work Lynch has ever done. And it just, you know, was just perfect. The show wins everything. Kyle wins it, you know, but it left everyone like, well, that's a little interesting. (laughs) So I don't know. It all depends on how the, the voters view it. Yeah, I could see uh, the end of part 17 kind of throwing it off a little bit. But I don't know. I could see, I could see him getting things for all the Mr. C stuff. Um, Stephanie says he might as well screw Laura. It makes more sense than Diane. Um, now, see, that would have been really interesting if he had gone back, grabbed Laura, and then, it, then him and Cheryl Lee in the motel. Instead of Diane and Cooper, 
that would have been amazing. And then just end it with them just completely naked and frog moss just crawling out of both of their mouths and just end the series. Oh my God. That would have been, that would be so traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> like I could just see people like heart palpitations. What? How did we get here? I mean, I thought that anyway with Diane and Cooper, but Jesus. But you know what though? If it had been Laura and Cooper, I don't think people would have been as confused and maybe a little bit bored that they were with the whole Diane Cooper scene. A lot of people were bored in that scene. They were like, what is this scene? Why are we here? What is going on? What's Lynch's fascination with Laura during naked? Um, you know, and it was just kind of like, cause we were confused. We didn't know what was going on what was it about? But if it had been Laura Palmer and Cooper in that motel scene, that would have really been amazing. I mean that, yeah, that, that would, that would have sold the season. I think the whole, I mean, everybody thought this exactly why, like everybody thought the same thing. And then you see that behind the scenes thing with Lynch and it's like exactly what everybody thought. Blue velvet. I know he says 25 years later, but (laughs) it's, I don't know. I would have loved, I mean, now we might get it. I didn't know that little fun fact. Well, um, now, now I want to put that in my movie. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. But it's just it's, it's that. But that. But see, that's that's what I'm talking about. Just talking about how you could tweak things and change a little of this, a little of that. Wow, become something even even cooler. The, just the icon, like the iconic nature of what that scene would have been. Like uh, Diane and Cooper. That's it's not nearly as iconic and as Diane and, and, and or. I mean, Cooper and Laura. And instead of playing the 50s music, if they had just played during the their sex scene, the Fire Walk With Me theme. With, with that the, music. With the with sax the, with, yeah, the sax and just make it all slow and romantic and and just like, you know what I mean? And then you realize that like they're just, yeah, that just would be amazing. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem with coming on videos and talking about this material because you actually in real time start to realize that if you had been in the room with frost and lynch and could spitball these ideas to them one of them would have been like that's interesting you know now i'm thinking what could happen what else could happen in that scene that we have like we have cooper and and lord doing it and then maybe they, they we slight the camera pans a little bit to the, the lower right, and we see like maybe like two rings on top of each other. On like I don't know what the significance of that would be, but I think it's a cool shot. Like them sl- slightly like go out of focus, and we pan, and the two like owl cave rings are on top of each other, like on on like a nightstand or like a a drawer. <laughs> Well, well, I'll tell you what I was terrified about. I was terrified that Cooper was going to go back in time, save Laura and realized things were even worse. And so Cooper, I, I was scared that we were going to head towards Cooper was going to have to be the one to kill Laura in the train car mm-hmm. and make it happen. <laughs> but I also I, was hoping, I also was hoping for maybe an even different, like a happy ending where Cooper and Janie E have their kid and it's a girl. And we realized that they named her Laura and this was Laura reincarnated like that would have been cool too. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's so many ways you could have gone with this thing, but I still maintain that in my mind, in my mind, when, when uh, Cooper and Carrie page or whatever drive into twin peaks at the end and the whole town is dead in my humble opinion, I look at it as the woodsmen are there. They've overtaken the town. They've tapped out Dr. Jacoby, the doctor amp, there's bugs crawling in everyone's mouths. And that's why the town is completely desolate and just nobody on the road. And that's when they pull up um, to the house. Now, if I had my say again, Mary Reber, she was great in that final scene, Mm -hmm. but let me flip it. They knock on the door, opens the door is the old lady from the Mr. Jackpots. And that's Mrs. Treeman. And then she calls over her grandson and it's red. And that's how you end the series. Yeah. You bring it all together. 
and that uh, would have absolutely made me sp- speechless. My mouth would have been dropped. Do we know Sarah Palmer's maiden name? We will in the book. Uh huh. <laughs> If it turns out to be Tremond or Chalfont, I don't think it will be, but that means they do have the right house in in, <laughs> in one way or another. Um, Reggie says, do you think Lynch and Frost are studying your videos while they write season four? Listen, uh, th- th- they aren't, but I wish they would. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I mean, get it, get us on to just like, con- like, you know what, you know, you know what I would love, honestly, is like, don't have to give me credit, bring me into a writer's room with Frost and Lynch, and let me submit uh, ideas. Just spitball with them, or I would just type up ideas and be like, "This is where I think you should go with this," and they can take it or leave it. But I want to be able to at least throw it out to them, so they have something to think about. Throw it out to them so that like it hits their hits their brain at That's least. That's the point. Just so so just so it like is there. That's the point. Because then, all because all Lynch needs he doesn't need a, a clear through plot line, but what he does need is that idea, that initial spark. And if you say door opens and it's is is the is the Mister Jackpot's lady, that would just you know. But the thing is though, again, this is all done. As, um, you know, standalone scenes. So he probably didn't have access to those people. So, mm-hmm. you know, okay, we're going to use the owner of the house and that's great because she was very kind to let us use it. And that works great. But if, if this was a traditional movie and you had everybody on set around the same time, I can, I can see, you know, Hey, why don't we have this person open the door? Oh, this is how we can tie in red. Make him the grandson. That explains the magic. Hello. Yeah. That, right? that, Without explaining it, you explain it. Just him being there. Just like, just him being there. Right, because then that puts into context the scene with Richard Horn flipping the coin. Hmm. You know, the coin spun in the air. But Yeah, yeah. Right, so you don't have to explain anything, but if you just know he's the grandson, ooh, that explains a lot. <laughs> God, D. I still want to know if the if the, if they're Tremons and Chalfons. I want to know if they have that that picture in the house. That would have been cool too. Like even if they didn't like, even if they just hint like they panned it in a way where you see it like over her shoulder, but you can't really tell. But you can tell just enough. Like you could see those weird green, like that ugly green color. Mm. Well, another thing I thought they were going to do, but they didn't do it either, which is when Laura tells James and Firewalk with me, your Lord disappeared. Mm-hmm. I thought they were going to, I thought they were going to flip it too, where it's like when Laura's staying in her room and she sees herself in the painting, I thought that they were going to say that the good Laura was trapped in the lodge and the doppelganger was Laura was the one that got killed. See, I thought that too. I, ha- I had the same idea. I thought that would have been interesting. Yeah. So. Now I'm okay with them not doing that, but I I could have seen them do a little switcheroo like that. Like the the good lore is still like she's still there. <laughs> she's... Well, she was she was anyway. So, I mean, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, they didn't have to do that, and it's fine that they didn't. But I I could have I could have seen them go. Wouldn't it be cool since we're dealing with duality if we had Laura's doppelganger die, and then you know, mm-hmm. I, I could have seen them do that. But another thing about like you're talking about Ray Wise. I really think that we could have gotten more Phoebe Augustine as Ronette. I think that uh, to me, I always thought Ronette should have played a crucial role in this new series in terms of uh, uh, helping to get Cooper out of the lodge. After all, she did see an angel. She, yeah. she is the only one that seen Bob, you know, besides Cooper, of course. I also think it would have been great for uh, James Hurley when he's playing the song in the roadhouse to have him look over at the two girls that were singing and in one shot 
one shot, I know it's difficult to do, but in one shot, it should have been Maura Kelly and it should have been Cheryl Lee dressed up as Madeline as the two girls. I think that would have been so powerful. It was almost like he was paying tribute to the two women that died. Just like ha- have him play and then do this really close this close shot of James and then like a slow pan. And they're just both looking at him singing into the, just you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Maura Kelly playing Donna and having Cheryl Lee play Madeline Ferguson. Because listen, everyone loves Cheryl Lee as Laura Palmer. So do I. But she was equally great as Madeline Ferguson. And no one gives her credit for that role. I know. And, I and actually, she plays Madeline Ferguson longer than she's ever played Laura Palmer. I know. <laughs> I, I honestly love Maddie, especially, you know, I, reading The Secret Diary and having that context for Maddie. I know it's not necessarily canon, but I, I don't know. I like knowing the, a little bit more about Maddie, too. I love yeah. Maddie, like in her PJs, running down the, the stairs of the Palmer house with those big old glasses, you know, unscrewing bedposts, finding Laura's tapes, stuff like that. Like, that's... That's like my my perfect woman right there, yeah. <laughs> Maddie Ferguson. Where did where did I don't remember where did Maddie live? Where she where, where she was from Missoula, Montana. That's oh, from right. David, one of David Lynch's hometowns. Uh huh. Okay, I remember now. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> see, see the see the problem with these podcasts is that we could literally go for hours. I know, it's already here. And it's already been three hours here, so we should probably wrap this one up, yeah. at least for me. No, yeah, same. You, you can, to, you, can, to to bed. you can stay on for another five hours, but I need to go to bed. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, Cameron. Oh, yeah, this was a surprise. I, I didn't expect you to be on tonight, so this is great. Yeah, I, was, I, I wasn't planning on it, and then I was like, let's do a surprise, like a, like a pre-book show. But we ended up talking about Firewalk with me most of the time, which is fine because no, we talked about a lot of stuff. I know we we and then all our well, our, we can't. We don't want to spoil. We don't. We don't want to spoil the book, even if we know some stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's better to just. I mean, we hinted that enough, but uh, yeah, totally yeah. great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming on. Catch you soon. <laughs> all right, guys. I shall see you later. Uh, I hope you guys are looking forward to the book. Uh, some people are saying the audio should be out now. It is 12 o'clock here on the East Coast, so it's probably out f- for us. Um, so I shall talk to you guys very soon about this. I'm going to get it sometime today, and then we're definitely going to have discussions. All right, guys. See you later.